Hello friends. Welcome to Muse Fanfiction. How are you all? So in this video, we will see what if Naruto inherited the dark blackfire bloodline of dragon gods and stood against the world. But before we start, if you want more amazing stuff like this, then be sure to subscribe to our channel and like this video. Also if possible share this video with your friends. Now without wasting any more time. Let's begin the story. Riverlands Westeros 283 AC Even now it was a challenge for Rhaegar to focus on the task at hand. His mind repeatedly wandered to his family. Most of his family, more specifically his two wives and his children by them. It had taken much doing but rather than separate Elia and Lyanna as had been suggested by some of his closest friends, the crown prince had instead had them quietly removed to Dragonstone along with his mother. He had no doubt that his father would be furious when he realized that Elia was not in fact in the capital within reach to threaten their staunchest allies with. Truth be told his father was making this rebellion far worse than it should have been. If he had simply allowed Rhaegar to speak with the Starks, or at the least not murdered them, even Rhaegar knew that what his father had done was no execution. His greatest enemies it seemed were on both sides of the conflict. Robert Baratheon's crude brash actions and his own father's sadistic madness were making the whole realm bleed. Rhaegar knew he wasn't blameless. He also knew plenty would claim him mad for allowing dreams to decide his actions, they weren't Targaryens though. How could they imagine let alone understand a dragon dream? Most of his family didn't even have them. My prince, Barristan's voice broke the man from his thoughts. Ah, forgive me Barristan. You were saying? Rhaegar asked a little embarrassed he so easily was lost in thought yet again. Barristan seemed to easily catch on to what bothered his liege and sent a small understanding smile toward the younger man. The majority of the king's guard were all of the mind that prince took far too much onto his own shoulders, not that there was much of an alternative. After all, Aerys was, unstable and while the whole of the royal court remarked about how wistful and melancholic Rhaegar often looked, they remained simply interested in the fact that it made him more attractive to the ladies than the fact he looked so tired and distraught because he was plagued by terrible visions and responsibilities. You need not worry for Princess Elia and Lady Lyanna. Your wives are in excellent care under Arthur's watch. They also have each other, Barristan said. Yes, yes, you're right. Still I worry. Thankfully since Elia and Lyanna actually met they seem almost like sisters now. I was worried. The prince said as a small amused grin played on his lips. Had Lyanna been like any other lady in the realm I don't think they would have. You were lucky to fall for such a. Barristan sought for a word to use without speaking ill of the woman. Thankfully Rhaegar took mercy on him and cleared his throat to speak. Unique Barristan. The word is unique. The ivory cloaked knight nodded his head deeply so as not to show too much of his grin. While he suspected that the prince was not quite as enamored with his wives as many believed, he had no illusions that the man didn't care for them. Rhaegar was nothing if not passionate. Both Princess Elia and Lyanna had quickly made it clear they had fallen for the prince and while Barristan knew better than most the reasoning for Rhaegar's brash decision to take both as wives, he also knew the prince was a compassionate individual as if to compensate for his father's cruelty. I must focus on the battle to come though. Report. Rhaegar said choosing to focus on the task laid out before them. As you say. Barristan nodded. The majority of our forces have already crossed the river. Our northern flank is led by Lewin and he's already had the men under his command readying defenses for the rebels. And the rebel forces? Rhaegar asked. They initially rushed here. I think they hoped to catch us before we crossed the river, but with most of our troops already crossed they decided to let their men rest for a time and have been arranging themselves along the slopes of hills across from Lewin's forces. Barristan explained. The hills are not steep enough to give them any real advantage. The far side is steep enough to prevent flanking attacks so they have that against us, the elder knight said. What of the men under Jonathor? The prince questioned. He's moved with most of our forces and has taken the opposite flank to Lewin, Barristan explained. I see, then when we have all our troops across we will rest as long as we can. We aren't sleeping out here though. We advance before midday. Rhaegar ordered. Yes my prince. Barristan said before heading off to ensure that the prince's wishes were followed. They didn't have long though as the rebel host decided it disliked its odds against the full royalist force. Advancing quickly across the flat ground between their armies, the vanguard of the rebel troops was led by none other than Robert Baratheon himself. Impatient bastard. 
Rager cursed as he had his helmet fitted onto his head and climbed atop his horse. He rushed forward along with the last of his men still crossing the river just as the rebel cavalry smashed into the spears and shields of the Dornishmen, buying time for the rest of the force to cross over. Within moments the field of battle had fallen into a mess of bodies and screaming animals that once claimed to be men. The earth was torn up under the boots and shoes of soldiers and hooves of horses alike and rapidly became a pit of mud. As the last of both forces joined the fray Rager realized with some relief that the Baratheon's impatience had played into his favor. Even though some of his troops were out of position, the charge against the spears and hastily crafted defenses had bled the rebels badly and blunted the attack they made considerably. With the Dornish troops Rager could pick out the glistening white of Prince Lewin as he slew what was likely Lord Corbray and taking up the dead man's own Valyrian blade set upon the remainder of the Corbray's household slaughtering several, to include likely the man's son. Yes, the battle had turned decidedly into the crown prince's favor. Now what remained was breaking the rebel army's waning spirit. At once it seemed Rager was presented with just the opportunity to do that. Robert burst from a mesh of men and horses. His armor was dented and scratched but clearly holding up finely and his hammer was drenched in the gore of an untold number of Rhaegar's men. Rhaegar himself looked similar, his black armor encrusted with rubies in the shape of his house was splattered by the blood of a great many rebels and his sword was dripping with even more. As if the climax to some tale told to them as children, the two men, cousins, enemies, began to circle one another, gauging the best opportunity to strike. They didn't speak. Each had reason to hate the other and even if one's reasoning was built upon a falsehood, any chance they might have had to negotiate had passed long ago. So they remained silent and let their weapons speak for them. The fight was as brutal as the carnage surrounding them but also uniquely beautiful. The difference in abilities and preferences when in combat was fully on display. Robert, a beast of a man, swung his hammer with ease. One-handed when it would take any other man too. He was nothing but rage and power the embodiment of his house's words. Rager moved with agility and grace unseen among any but the best of swordsmen. He danced around the rebel leader and narrowly avoided any strike the other man launched. For a time they seemed stalemated. Rager untouchable and Robert unbreakable. That is until Rager did something completely unexpected and slammed himself into the larger man. Caught off guard and off balance, Robert stumbled, only for Rager to do it again and tackle the Baratheon to the ground. Perhaps due to his shock at the move or exhaustion from the battle, Robert had little chance to defend himself as he felt the sharp point of Rhaegar's sword stab up under his arm through the weak point in his armor. He could only widen his eyes in shock and pain as his last breath left his body in a choked gargle of blood and spit. Rhaegar ripped his blade free but ensured the rebel's death by tearing off the man's helmet and swiftly running the sharp edge across his throat. Robert, already dead, didn't struggle. As the prince stood over his slain foe he could hear the word of Robert's death quickly spread across the battlefield through rebel and loyalist alike. Within minutes the fighting came to an end as the rebels surrendered or fled. The army settled in to collect the dead and treat the wounded in the aftermath of the fighting. Rager had ordered Robert's body not to be desecrated. He hoped to bring an end to that ridiculous siege of Storm's End by returning the corpse to his ancestral home. He'd also sent his own healers to care for Eddard Stark. If there was any house truly wronged in this mess it was the Starks. He was married to one of them now and hoped to make them at least see he was not his father. Perhaps treating Ned and showing him that his sister was not in fact kidnapped would mend the damage caused by Aerys if only slightly. For right now though he wished to rest. The battle had been exhausting and now, a few hours after the end of it all he was finally clean of the blood and grime from the fighting. Maybe he would be exhausted enough to avoid any dreams as he slept. The crown prince would be right but it would be one of the last dreamless nights he would experience in his life. Red Keep King's Landing 291 A.C. Rager stared down over the courtyard as he watched his wives and mother interacting with the children. He couldn't stop his soft smile as he watched his son Aegon dragging Rhaenys and Visenya along after him. Rhaenys, his eldest child and his daughter by Elia was the spitting image of her mother. Olive skin and dark hair and eyes he knew his own father disliked her appearance and Rhaegar did his best to keep them apart to shield her from Aerys' cruelty. Aegon, the middle child and only son was his own spitting image. Violet eyes and curly silver hair, he was an excitable child and often drug his sisters along after him. The youngest of the trio was Visenya. A blending of her mother Lyanna and himself, he already knew she would grow into a beauty just like her elder sister. 
The unique mixing of Stark and Targaryen features she possessed made even Aerys hold his tongue. Her hair ran from the dark Stark brown into a blonde and finally the Targaryen white at its ends. All three were adorable and precious in his eyes but just as the soft smile on his face had come it quickly faded as his thoughts drifted to their future and the recent changes to his dreams over the years. Once he had dreamt of a three-headed dragon or three dragons seeming to rule over this land together peacefully. They were powerful and just and he had no doubt in his mind that the dragon or dragons as the case might be were his own children. He was sure of it. That was of course why the recent dreams had affected him so dramatically. Both Elia and Lyanna had often tried to coax him into more rest as dark circles began to collect under bloodshot eyes. It was no use though as his dreams made sure there was no peaceful rest to be found. At least not yet. Not until he could ensure that everything would be safe for his children's future. It was the most important task for a parent, even one that was to be king. Thankfully he had met with his father on one of his better days recently and they had sent someone to find what he had dreamt of. That was one thing. Even with his madness Aerys had never once doubted his son's dreams. They had saved their house twice before and none of the household was intent on spitting in the face of such a gift. Or so Rhaegar hoped. As days passed and the word from their men set to Essos remained silent, he grew tense. What other than a blackfire could the dark dragon he dreamt of mean? As it grew and devoured Essos simply watching the three smaller dragons in the west curiously as they tested on the roof of the Red Keep. Curiously. It wasn't hostile, not like Blackfires had been in the past. That was his hope, perhaps to come to some sort of agreement with this distant relative destined for greatness. Maybe even marrying his own younger sister to them to tie the houses together. His own three children would be wedded in the future after all. Just like his parents, well hopefully not just like his parents. Only time would tell, he needed patience, he needed rest. Maybe he could sleep peacefully for a moment. Maybe a brief time of no dreams or visions. He almost prayed for it. Nern lands of the long summer. Esos 291 AC Naruto enjoyed his little free time playing with his friends. His parents were strict taskmasters in his training and studying but they were still his loving mother and father. They didn't wish for him to miss out on all chances to play with other children and simply be a child. No good parent wanted that. That didn't mean that Naruto's free time was anything other than rare though. His mother and father were the rulers of their people, the leaders of Nern and the head priest and priestess of their faith. It was a lot to live up to, but they and everyone in their community had reminded him time and again that he was blessed by the true god. We must be getting home, Naruto. One of his friends called out as they began to disperse back through the town's gates. Oh, okay, well tomorrow then, he asked. Don't be silly everyone knows you have studies and training. We can play together again in a few days," another of the group said before running off. Ugh, yeah, the young boy groaned. He wasn't terribly upset, though it was a bit annoying. He'd seen the others all out playing every day but he couldn't participate. He understood why of course. His father said they were meant for something more. He was meant for something more. The others knew their place was to serve at his leisure but that meant he had to be powerful and knowledgeable enough to command them. Slowly he made his own way back into the town of Nern. He could still recall snippets of their time before coming here. Days traveling and fighting off raiders. He remembered them taking the old fort as well. It was an ancient Valyrian outpost, with one wall crumbling toward the shore having been replaced with a wooden palisade that expanded to a small town. He mostly remembered the fires and screams though as they took their new home. Now, the town of Nern was the home of the true faith, as his father referred to them. Naruto was still uncertain of the differences between themselves and the ones his parents referred to as the misguided but he knew that it had much to do with the nature of their god. Relor, Melkor, two halves of the whole. His father often preached to the townsfolk about how their brothers and sisters had been misled into believing the one they considered the other was not in fact a part of their one true god. The darker, portion, Melkor was the shadow to Relor's light, the darkness to the flame. Naruto, his mother called, causing Naruto to turn his thoughts away from his repetitive studies. Mother. He grinned as he raced up the steps past the two men dressed in black and red that stood at guard for the thick stone building's door. Have a good day with your friends? Artoria asked her child. Yes. Naruto replied. Most of the boy's appearance came from his mother, 
She was two generations away from pure blackfire blood but her pale blonde hair and elegant are perhaps more aptly. Regal features were the only real surviving traits of that lineage. That and her complete resistance to heat and flame. Her child was much the same, though he had his father's pale blue eyes and slightly warmer skin tone. I'm glad. She said as she leaned down to muss up his pale locks. Now go get ready for your dinner. Your father will be home soon. The boy nodded and did as told as Artoria awaited her husband. He was a good man, as far as someone in her position could ask for. Rather more manipulative and a bit colder than she would like despite his charismatic exterior, but there was nothing in the world he cared for more than her child with him and their goals as a group. Off in a dream? A voice called to her from far closer than she expected. Torin. She said simply, though a small smile played across her lips. Yes, love? He asked as he stepped up to walk into the old holfast with her against his side. I had another dream last night. It was confusing though, she said, causing the man to stop. Tauron was once a high-ranking red priest before he led a collection of his followers on what he believed to be the right path. Branded a heretic, it was largely through his gifts with mysticism and magics from their lord and his wife's dreams that they survived for so long as a group. Ready for their former brothers and sisters to try to stamp out the heresy they supposedly spread wherever they roamed. Another premonition then, what of it this time? He asked seriously. Something vile and twisted with madness watching us. Watching Naruto and then fire. I woke but knew there was little to go on so I tried to sleep and recapture it but every time the dream seemed just as confusing. Madness and fire, nothing else, I couldn't even make our family out after the first time. The woman worried. Torin frowned, his eyes glittered ominously as the dream, like all her dreams, likely spelled an attack on them. It didn't give him details though. Usually her visions were far clearer and more specific. Perhaps another night will allow you to capture the vision again. Besides getting the guards ready there isn't much else we can do, he said as he guided her back to the table where they both smiled at the patiently waiting boy inside. My son, how was your day? He asked with a loving smile on his face, one reserved only for those in his family. The family enjoyed their evening meal catching up from a relatively lazy day. Torin had primarily overseen the digging of a new well on the far side of town while Artoria had led a few sermons among the mothers and wives in the village. Of course Naruto was the most excited about sharing his day. His parents often felt refreshed at his remaining innocence. While they wanted him ready for the burdens that awaited him, they were not excited at ending his childhood in the slightest. Before long the sun had begun to drift into the horizon and long shadows stretched across Nern. Naruto was sent to bed and Torin and Artoria likewise retired following their prayers to their god of light and shadow. Sleep came quickly but for Artoria it did not come peacefully. No sooner had she drifted off than her dreams came back to her. This time though they were different, far more like when she had dreamt in the past and helped to prevent the many surprise attacks on their traveling group. She saw riders, a hundred or more cresting a hill and staring down at what was undoubtedly Nern. The riders were then joined by many more men. Mercenaries, by now the town came alive as the people saw them and sprang to the defenses. Then it changed she could see men, no. Women five of them scaling the walls of the holfast until they were at her own window. Silently they slipped in, approaching herself and Torin as they quickly readied. She watched herself blink in shock and suddenly turned to face what could only be assassins. With that the dream ended and Artoria awoke gasping. She turned to see Torin awake suddenly as well with worry for her in his eyes. Another dream? He asked. Yes, and, she began to explain only for the village alarm bells to begin ringing and cries of warning to quickly spread throughout the town. It came too late then. Torin frowned as he sprang up and began to dress in his red and black tunic and armor. Artoria was just behind him, doing the same until she froze and turned to face the same assassins as before, thankfully even before her dream self had realized they were coming. The first was only halfway through the window before Artoria hurled herself at the woman and sent her tumbling back through the opening. Unless she fell on her head, Artoria doubted the assassin would die from such a fall but broken limbs were hopefully enough to take the woman out of the fight. Assassin's Torin, she cried as she abandoned her attempt to dress in her armor and instead grasped for her blade on its stand nearby. The weapon was believed to be lost and had as much if not more of a history than Artoria's bloodline. It carved through the next two assassins as they desperately tried to force their way into the holfast. Thankfully by this point Torin was ready and he engaged them himself. 
Artoria, go to Naruto. I'll end them and join the defense. He commanded. She was gone before he finished speaking. Naruto awoke with a start. He'd had a nightmare. Men were attacking the town and while it seemed they weren't able to beat the people of Nurn something was wrong. It was like it was a distraction. His dream ended almost as quickly as it had come though as he awoke to the sounds of the bells across the village clanging to warn of an impending attack. Confused and frightened the young boy had gotten out of bed and made his way to his window to see what he could. Having one of the rooms that looked out over the town, he was shocked to see exactly what his dream had shown him. A mass of men roared as they charged across the fields surrounding the town toward the walls that defended his home. Soon the clanging of bells could only barely be heard over the clashing of men as hastily built ladders were put into place and the defenders battled their invaders along the short walls. Still, somehow he heard the sounds of fighting just below him and he turned his eyes down to look at the immediate courtyard of his home finding the last of his family's guards falling to a small collection of menacing figures that has somehow slipped around the rest of the town and into the Holfast's walls. I have to tell mother and father. He thought aloud as he turned away from the window only to freeze as his door slowly swung open. Before him stood a figure dressed darkly, just as those in the courtyard had been. The man, as he seemed too tall and broad to be a woman, simply stared at Naruto as the flickering fires and moonlight through the window reflected off of the steel of his sword. I'd hoped you would be asleep little one. I take no pleasure in ending a child. I'll make it painless oh. He said to Naruto only to twist and block a strike from Naruto's mother as she arrived on the scene. Much to his shock though her blade shattered his own and quickly cleaved its way through him as well, taking his life. She was already racing into the room and taking Naruto's hand and dragging him after her. They killed the guards and there's dozens inside, mother. He stammered out. The thought of the dead assassin was forced from his mind as he followed after her. I know, there's a way out through here. She said as calmly as she could. What about father? He asked worriedly. Artoria grit her teeth faintly as her own worried thoughts went to her husband. She knew him to be powerful though, and humanly powerful and gifted with dark abilities that would give him an edge over their attackers. Your father will meet up with us after he leads our people to repel the attackers. I'm going to take you and get to the refuge. She explained as the descended a set of stairs leading underground. W what is this? He asked as they descended into a series of decrepit tunnels. Ancient dungeons dating back to the Valyrian Freehold. We've had no use for them but these old catacombs are still sturdy and extend out to the shoreline. Just stay close to me all right. She instructed. All right. The boy quietly responded as they slowed down so as not to trip in the darkness. Artoria stopped beside an old shelf and managed to light a small set of candles holding one in her free hand as she gripped the hilt of her sword tightly. It wasn't much but compared to the inky blackness the candle's light was a great help. We should be close to the refuge now. Artoria whispered before stopping as she saw the movement of figures ahead and heard the whimpering of children. My lady, an elderly voice whispered out hesitantly. Lissario, she asked. Yes, I got the town children to the refuge as we practiced in the past. I could find all of them in the confusion I'm afraid. The elderly man said as his face became illuminated in the darkness. I see, here take Naruto with you. The attack will fail, it's a distraction for a silent attempt on my family. Protect my son with your life. Do you understand? She commanded, eyes narrowed and dark to ensure his obedience. Of course my lady, I swear to our lord that I will do all I can to protect him and the other children. The old man said. Artoria glanced at the silhouettes of the other children in the group. She didn't care all that much for them. They were common children. Their kind died in droves across the world every day. Her child though was different. Naruto lives or no one lives Lissario. Artoria hissed surprising the man. He bowed after a moment though. Artoria's and Thorin's commands were absolute. Take this candle and go. There is a buried door near the beach. Simply force it open and wait in the grove of trees there. We'll retrieve you after this is over. She explained before turning to her son. Be brave my boy. She kissed him lovingly on the brow. We'll see you again soon. Yes mother, Naruto replied, forcing back the tears from the situation. He was raised better than that and it was expected that he would not cry. After all she would return soon to collect him there was no reason to cry. Good boy. Artoria said before she turned and disappeared into the darkness back toward the path she and Naruto had taken earlier. 
He tried to stare after her but there simply was not enough light to keep his eyes on his mother as she disappeared into the darkness. Artoria quietly crept up the stairs back into the hole fast, careful not to give herself away. She heard the few servants in the household putting up a meager fight against the assassins and felt her blood boil as her people died to the enemy. She was not heartless. She cared for the people her family led, but the choice was easy, and so she ignored the screams and cries of her servants as they were either killed or brutalized and sought out her husband. It was not that hard to find Torin, as unlike in the other parts of the old fortress the screams and cries for mercy around him were all unfamiliar. They belonged only to those who thought themselves capable of killing their family. They were quickly learning that was a far more difficult take than initially anticipated. Coming finally to the hall just within the main doors of the Holfast she paused at the sight before her. Torin held the man before him with one hand as he slowly sank to his knees. All the while his free hand hovered before the defeated opponent's face and seemed to pull a wisp-like energy from the man. Before long the figure's eyes had turned glassy and his cheeks had hollowed out as if he had been drained of life itself and Torin allowed him to collapse to the floor in a heap. You are already needing to replenish yourself, she asked, causing him to turn and face her. Artoria didn't flinch at the inhumanly pale eyes that stared back at her. She had been witness to him claiming the lives of sacrifices for his power before. There are more than I expected. I wasn't quite as conservative with my energy as I should have been. Torin replied as his features filled out to their normal healthy appearance, though his eyes remained eerie and haunting. Well, it seems I returned at the perfect time then to help remove these scum from our home. She said coolly while fully entering into the room. You look a mess dear. Tauron teased as he kicked the most recent corpse on the floor over and snatched up the dead man's dagger for his own use. Hum, Artoria said as she looked down at the bloodstained nightgown that she realized exposed far too much of her attractive figure. Well, I hope it was too dark for Lysario and the children to see much. She replied, causing Tauron to sigh. You are far too calm, he said as they both approached the door leading back into the holefast corridors. It's all an act, she said with a strained tone causing her husband to reach out and grip her free hand lightly. I know, he said sadly. You need more energy don't you? That one isn't near enough, the woman said as she removed hand from his and ran it across his cheek. Torin smiled tiredly at his wife, his partner in everything, she could always tell when he pushed himself too far. The town will be safe but I'm honestly worried, I can sense them, too many of them and our men are either dead or too far to help in time. Tauron said sadly. Naruto is safe though, Artoria reminded him. Yes, our boy is safe, Tauron replied wistfully. The pair turned as one as a door at the far end of the corridor slammed open and the bloody and clearly abused maid fell into the hall. She wept openly as one of the men chuckled, following after her in the door. He stopped and drove a sword through the poor woman's back and put out her chest as he entered the hall. He smiled at the sight of the two standing across from him while the rest of his men spilled around him through the doorway. You aren't from the faith are you? No followers of Relor among your number as far as I've seen. Tauron said as the numbers of killers facing off against him grew and grew till he and his wife were outnumbered more than ten to one. Does that matter to you? Think only a holy blade from your fire god can end you. The man asked. Actually you have it backwards. Were you from the faith we would have nothing to fear at all. No you're just mercenaries I imagine. Artoria spoke up. The man's eyes flicked over to her and took in her appearance. He licked his lips and frowned unhappily at the sight before him. Were that I had time to play with you. I wasted it on her I'm afraid. The man said as he spit on the corpse off the maid at his feet. Filth. Artoria hissed. The man just shrugged. He had no false sense of morality. He followed no real faith and he had no one to answer to by his employer. An employer that paid remarkably well. I really wish there was time. He sighed out, looking the woman over once again. Tauron had enough of the pointless banter. He didn't know precisely who had sent them, but it didn't matter. He'd kill as many as he could and should he and Artoria somehow win, he could always find out afterward. With a sputtering start an eerie dark flame came to life within his grasp and leapt from his fingertips toward the stunned murderers nearby. Two were engulfed in a ghostly flame immediately and the corridor fell to chaos as the couple moved forward into the mass of enemies to kill. Lissario and the children watched as another attempt was made by the attackers to breach the walls of Nern. 
A few fires had broken out but overall the townsfolk had begun to steadily turn back the mercenaries. While the old man remained worried, especially with the knowledge that the attack was a mere distraction, the boys and girls began to chatter happily about their families defeating the attackers. Lissario had repeatedly reminded them that they had to be quiet but it didn't matter. Their enemies seemed to be broken and ready to flee now. Their final attack was more one of desperation than anything. We'll be able to go back to the town soon everyone, Lissario said with some relief. Wait, someone's coming, Naruto harshly whispered, trying to quiet everyone. I bet it's our parents coming to bring us home, a girl suggested. No, wait, Lissario said. Too late as the girl and a handful of other children stepped out of their hidden place and into the path of dozens of rough-looking men headed away from the town. Well what do we have here? One of the men said as he quickly reached out to snatch hold of the girl causing her to scream. The other children backed away but they were easy to catch for the men. We're already getting paid for making an opening for those assassins the dragons hired right. Maybe a bit of bonus pay from these ones here could add to it. One of the men suggested. Bah it's just a handful of kids, I mean she's the oldest and I bet she hasn't even bled yet. Another commented. I heard that up in Manteris they prefer buying them young and unspoiled. Another piped up. And no, the girl whimpered. And no, the man holding her mocked. Well, still too bad there aren't that many. Another sighed sadly. There are, the girl said, causing the hidden children's eyes to widen in shock. Let me go home and I'll show you where. She cried out. She was the eldest in the group and she'd heard of the markets, especially in Manteris. The things they did to children especially girls was inhuman. That is if you weren't fed to the monstrosities the city possessed. One of the men on a horse rode to the front of the group and roughly pulled the young girl up onto the horse with him. He pulled her tightly against himself and grinned disgustingly down at her as she shivered in his grasp. Fine, tell me where the rest are and I won't sell you to the cannibal markets in Manteris. He rasped with a small laugh. There, over there in that grove. There is a door to the town's catacombs. She cried pointing the other children and Lissario out. Lissario grit his teeth but turned to the children. He couldn't hope to save them. Killing even one of the men would be a miracle but perhaps if they ran. Run children, run to the catacombs, he shouted, eyeing Naruto in particular before turning and flinging himself at the nearest of the mercenaries. Unsurprisingly it went poorly and Lissario crumpled to the ground with a simple blow to the side of his head. The mercenaries simply moved past him as they quickly encircled the children. Even as some raced toward the door back into the tunnels the men closed in. Naruto stood still, a handful, maybe ten in total managed to make it back into the catacombs and disappeared into the darkness, but Naruto knew that they could very well end up dying there. The old caves were a maze and without something to light the way they were a death trap. It didn't matter anyway. He was one of the furthest from the hatch and by the time he had torn his gaze away from Lissario, presumably dead on the ground, he realized he couldn't escape. He didn't even struggle as they bound him and the others. The youngest they quickly killed as they would struggle to keep up but Naruto and the majority were drug away their last look at Nern being the glowing flames that were beginning to be put out in a loud cheer of victory as the people of Nern relished their victory, not realizing what they had lost in the midst of the confusion. Red Keep King's Landing, 291 AC. Rager struggled in his sleep as a dream troubled his mind. Where once he dreamed of a golden era of dragons ruling Westeros and hopefully coming to form ties with the growing dragon in the east. Tonight the black and purple beast shattered chains that had been placed upon it and flew into a rage. It burned across Essos and crafted a whole new land from the ashes and roared in rage and pain. Rager felt pain and regret staring at the beast, not that he could understand why. Those feelings died away as the monstrous dragon turned its eyes west and glared at the much smaller and more timid dragons that Rager knew to represent his own house. No, what changed? He asked as he saw the curious look the beast once looked at them which was long gone and replaced with one of hate and hunger. The prince watched as the titanic monster lifted itself to its full height before launching off of the ground with a burst of speed that seemed impossible. The creature made directly for Rager and the dragons he knew to be his own children. Its great maw split open and the ominous purple glow of its unique flames began to spill out of its mouth as it closed in upon them. Why, 
He cried before suddenly rising up from his bed in the keep waking his bedmate for the night, Lyanna tonight. Rager, what happened? She asked tiredly as she gently clutched his arm. The man stared at her as reality crashed back in around him and he slowly laid back beside her. He pulled the woman closely against his body and pressed his lips against her shoulder as he calmed down. Rager, she asked tentatively. A dream, he admitted causing her to go rigid in his arms. By now Lyanna, like Elia, was fully aware of his dreams and their nature. She had been disbelieving at one time but now she was too cautious and perhaps even paranoid herself to completely discount the possible visions Rager possessed. What happened? She asked. Nothing. He said simply only to frown as she twisted around in the bed to stare into his eyes. It doesn't matter. A mistake I will handle in time. He reassured her, causing her to lose the heat in her eyes. When you need my help, you have it. She replied before rolling back over and giving him the cold shoulder. Of course, thank you, Lyanna, Rager said quietly as he stared at his second wife's slender back. By morning the conversation they'd had the night before had fallen to the back of Luann's mind as she and Elia looked in on the children with Queen Rayella. The royal children were beginning a new stage of education under a new grand maester sent by the citadel. Pycelle had simply grown too old and so Rager had convinced his father to retire the man. The fact that Rodi, the new maester, was financially supported in his education by Rager was carefully avoided in conversation. After all such heiress was known to be paranoid and it wouldn't do to have him seeing threats even among his own household. At least it wouldn't do to have him seeing more enemies among them. Just as Rodi was praising the children for their memorization of the Crownland's Nob Le House, Something important as they answered directly to the crown unlike most houses on the continent, Esser Arthur burst into the room. Maester Rodi, come with me. The king is having chest pains again. Arthur demanded and Rodi followed him without a word. Rayella followed along as well while Lyanna and Elia stayed with the children. The trio made quick time, first to Rodi's quarters to retrieve his medicines and tonics and then to the king's bedchamber. All of you besides my mother and Rodi get out, now. Rager demanded. Ray, Arthur began to argue but Barristan gripped him by the shoulder. Go on, Rager instructed. Slowly the white cloaks filtered out of the room and closed the door behind them leaving only the king, queen, prince, and maester. The maester rushed to mix the proper combination of items before approaching the unconscious man. He made to pour the fluid into the old man's mouth but instead his wrist was caught by Rager. Rayella watched silently in surprise as her son pried the small flask free from the maester's hand. None spoke as he walked over to the balcony and emptied the bottle out over the ledge. I see, Rodi quietly said as he realized what his master wanted of him. I will formulate a tonic to ease his majesty's passing. Rayella narrowed her eyes before stepping over to her unconscious husband. She stared down at her brother and her violet eyes darkened with hatred toward him. Is he in pain now, maester? She asked. Yes, your grace. Enough that it rendered him unconscious. Normally I would give him his tonic and he would awaken in a few hours. It would stop the pain and make it easier for his heart to work. The young man honestly answered his queen. Save your tinctures then maester. It's nowhere near the pain he deserves but Eris should suffer as he passes. Rayella said with a hiss. Rodi turned to his master but Rager simply nodded. Very well your grace, Rodi agreed. Ensure he does not wake up, Rodi. Rager ordered. Of course, your majesty. The maester replied as he turned back to his materials. Come mother, we need to inform the family and begin preparations for a funeral. Rager said. Finally, she coldly replied with a final look at her lifelong abuser. Rodi quickly mixed together a new mix. A poison, one that would ensure Eris never awoke and suffered silently for many more hours. The young maester adored the royal family, especially the queen and the little children. The knowledge of what this monster in a man's skin has done not only to the realm but his own wife and children disturbed him. He didn't speak as he drained the poisonous mixture into the king's mouth. With this the ascension of a good king was confirmed. Mantares, Essos, 295 AC. The sound of Naruto's fist connecting with the older boy's jaw would have been sickening if it hadn't been drowned out by the sound of the audience roaring from above them. The following series of blows to the boy's chest and face as he stumbled back were silenced in the same manner. 
he drove his opponent until they neared a wall and then changed tactics. Leaving the much larger team tottering on his feet dizzily for a moment, Naruto dropped back just out of his opponent's reach. Just as planned the larger of the two lunged forward, opening himself up completely to Naruto's brutal finishing blow to the inside of his knee. This time the crowd wasn't quite loud enough to keep the sickening wet pop from Naruto's ears and he couldn't stop the grimace that came to his face. The other boy collapsed screaming in pain, but Naruto's disgust at what he had done wasn't enough to stop his instincts to win and survive. The matches in the fighting pits of Manteris were all fought to the death. No exceptions. By now Naruto was used to the situation. He'd been here for years after all. Naruto climbed on top of his victim as the larger child struggled to stop him while blubbering for mercy and begging for help. He got nothing but the roar of the crowd and Naruto's deceptively strong hands around his neck. The crowd grew only louder as they watched the conclusion to the fight. Naruto shook with strain as he killed the older boy with his bare hands. The moment became surreal, like he was retreating from his own actions in his mind, it wandered to random thoughts. Like the fact that he disliked fighting with just his hands. Usually they gave them weapons. Naruto had found himself especially gifted with the sword and after some training was confident enough to call himself decent with the blade. That didn't mean that he was a master with the weapon by any stretch of the imagination but he had received some lessons in the basics back before he had been made into a slave. And yet again, Naruto wins. The host of the fight bellowed out getting several cheers and just as many if not more boos. He had been the underdog in the fight despite his record of punching above his age and size frequently. Naruto looked down and saw that his opponent was in fact dead. He still felt disconnected. When he took a life in the pits he usually did, slowly he climbed to his feet and exited the pit, receiving the money meant for his master and heading off into the merchant quarter. He didn't bother counting it. The masters at the pits were extremely brutal but they were also extremely honest. Had they not been, people knew better than to try and get one over on his master. A few other slaves and even other people greeted Naruto as he passed by. He was well known in this part of the city now. The only boy among the large batch of children brought in together to still be among the living. Naruto had to kill a few of them himself. Another win, little one. A harsh woman's voice asked, causing Naruto to return to the present form his thoughts and stop in the street to see a pair he had come to know rather well. Naruto smiled softly, yes, I beat all three of my opponents easily enough. The pit masters will probably make me fight some of the creatures again. The scarred woman approached him and gently mussed his hair. She and the man both chuckled as Naruto ducked out of her range. They knew he wasn't fond of people touching him like that, though they couldn't know it was because it reminded him of his mother and father. What are you two doing here anyway? I thought you both were leaving the city for work soon. Naruto said as he eyed the older pair, though they weren't much older than him. Asher managed to piss off our client so we're stuck here looking for more work again. The woman said shooting a look over at the man. Beska, that's not fair. The man was trying to, Asher said with a disgusted look. I know what he was doing. I don't actually blame you for breaking his nose. Doesn't change the fact we're stuck here in Manteris until we find something else. Beska said with a sigh. The man nodded with a disappointed look on his face. No one truly wanted to stay in Manteris, but still people were seemingly drawn to it. Or in Naruto's case dragged to it. So have you been learning any more of that mystical stuff from that old master of yours? Beska asked turning to look at Naruto again. Yes, well lately he seemed different. I think he is starting to get sick again. He's too old to power through it too. Naruto said somewhat sadly. The man might have been his master but he had been very kind to Naruto and trained him to use the same abilities his father had used. Not near to that level yet but still, he taught him something few in the world believed existed. Then again things like that were common here in Manteris. Wait, can't he use his magic to keep himself healthy or something? Asher asked. I doubt it works like that. Beska commented with a roll of her eyes. Actually, Master has already been doing it but he's started to grow weaker. He said we needed more money for medicine so that was why he set up three fights for me today. He says he has faith in my ability to save him like he saved me. Naruto said with a small smile. Beska and Asher both frowned at that. 
They disagreed with that sentiment. Naruto did more for his old master than he had done for Naruto. Still, they weren't about to step into the middle of it when Naruto's master was one of the few not looking to torture or abuse his slave. I really should be getting back to the shop. Master will want me back before time for dinner. He has Marina making a big meal tonight. I think it's to celebrate my win. It's like he doesn't think I can lose. Naruto said happily. Well, you haven't given him a reason to doubt. I always bet on you when I am around. Asher said before flinching when Beska slugged his shoulder for betting on slave fights. As a former pit slave herself she definitely didn't appreciate that. See you later little one. Beska said as she must up his hair again. She laughed as the boy batted her hand away and took off toward his master's shop and home. The pair of mercenaries watched him go with a small frown on their faces. They often felt something was wrong around his master, and had both come to like Naruto quite a lot in their time with him. They couldn't figure out why they disliked the boy's master though. They suspected perhaps they were just bigoted toward the use of magic at times. It was unnatural, especially the old man's. They'd seen a couple of his kind here in Manteris, each worse than the last. But this man appeared as a kind and caring grandfather figure, even to his own slaves. It didn't match with the sickening feeling he put off to the pair of experienced survivalists every time they met. Beska, Asher began, I'm with you, maybe just peeking in on them, she said. Yeah, Asher agreed before they both followed after Naruto, clearly out of sight of the boy. Naruto entered the small shop with a loud call of being back. Rather than his master answering it was the man's other slave. A massive woman, perhaps of Dothraki descent that doubled both as their master's maid and bodyguard. She was extremely committed to the old man, though she was cordial to Naruto too, it was clear she was more concerned with their master's interests than Naruto's well-being. Wash the blood and dirt off of yourself before dinner boy. Master wants you to be clean for the meal. She commanded flatly, taking the coins from his grasp and disappearing back into the small kitchen area. Right, Naruto sighed out as he headed through the ground floor and into the small yard area in the back. A basin of water was already there as his master liked both Naruto and Marina to be clean. Naruto hurriedly scrubbed himself clean as he felt his stomach grumble in hunger. He could smell the meal from outside even out here and it wasn't helping his hunger in the slightest. Thankfully he was able to clean himself up and change quickly. Once back inside he found his master sitting at the table just as Marina was setting it for the meal. It smelled wonderful, and Naruto could tell whatever it was it had a large helping of meat in it. Ah, Naruto my boy, I had total faith you would be victorious. Though tell me, are you tired? The old master asked with a grandfatherly smile. Thank you master, I'm far less tired than I am hungry. Naruto replied. Oh, I'm sure lad. Well, help yourself, this is for you after all. The man said with a weak chuckle. Thank you master, thank you as well Marina. Naruto said shooting his fellow slave a grin, the woman simply set the boy's overflowing plate before him and sat down to her own meal. It was clear that the master had instructed to give Naruto a sizable amount of both his and her portions. At least it seemed that way to Naruto as their meals were smaller than his own. The boy dug in quickly and the conversation at the table was sparse as the older pair watched the boy devour his meal until nothing remained on his plate. A few moments later and he had begun to grow sleepy. Naruto, stay awake now. I'm sure you feel tired after a long day with so many fights and such a big meal, but I have one more gift to give you. The master explained as he stood from the table. Really? Naruto asked while fighting back a yawn. Of course my boy, really it's two gifts come with me, he instructed as he led Naruto up to the second floor of their small shop. They entered one of the three rooms on the second floor of the building. The first two were the bedrooms, one which Naruto shared with Marina and the other for the master. This room though was where the old man did his work. Mystical writing and items covered practically every corner and wall of the room while at the center a large work table sat. I have to say you have continued to impress me, Naruto. Not only have you grown into a strong young lad though all your trials and troubles, and become quite strong, you have surpassed my every expectation when learning of our shared ability. That is why today I will be imparting on you my final lesson. A spell that requires a bit of preparation, but one that I have been readying for quite some time now. 
The master explained as he retrieved an old worn looking tome. A final spell. That can't be, there has to be so much more that I can learn from you. Naruto proclaimed. Neither master or slave apprentice noticed the figures watching from just outside on the lower rooftop. Sadly my boy, this old body is deteriorating far too quickly. I would have preferred teaching you for much longer but sadly our time together will come to a close soon. So that is why I am granting you two gifts. The first is this grant. The old man presented a page to Naruto. Naruto quickly read it over. His eyes widened as he did so. The paper granted him his freedom from bondage. He was free to go as he pleased now. His mind immediately thought of returning home, back to Nern, if it was still there. Naruto, there is one more thing, like I said. A spell, the old master said. Er, yes master, Naruto said. It's easy to impart, easy enough. All you have to do my boy is clasp your hand with mine and open your mind as I had taught you. He said holding out the gnarled and wretched limb he called a hand. Naruto blinked. He recalled reading some of his masters, no Braca's tomes when he wasn't paying attention. It had often warned of opening your mind to another magister while making physical contact. He trusted the old man. He had been like a grandfather to him more than a master, but he felt concerned. He felt the hair on the back of his neck raise on end as he stared at the offered hand. Come now boy, I'm not growing any younger while waiting for you over here. Brakey's hissed. Right, Naruto said as he slowly extended his hand. Brakey surprised him by roughly snatching Naruto's hand into his and suddenly grinning broadly as a sickly green crawled up across Naruto's skin from where the two hands gripped one another. A moment later and an agonizing pain raced across his being and most especially his head. However, through either natural instinct or some subconscious awareness of his former master's ploy, Naruto's mind was not open as Brakey's had asked. Foolish child, you try to resist me after everything I have done for you. He demanded as Naruto found himself facing against a much younger and monstrous looking man than the old master he had known. M. Brakey's, he asked, open your mind to me, he commanded pulsing with power and causing a wave of pain and nausea to sweep across Naruto's form. What is this? Naruto demanded. Silence. Open your mind and surrender your being to me. You belong to me. Brakey's screamed meantally. Finally things made sense to Naruto. Brakey's was attempting to possess him. No, it was more than a simple possession. He wanted to assimilate Naruto's being into his own and take his body. That was the only real reason he had been freed. Brakey's wouldn't like to be a slave. What is this? Brakey's asked in confusion as he found himself unable to break through Naruto's mental defenses. How is this possible? You always meant for this. Naruto asked sadly. Oh, be silent child. I treated you well and made sure you lived happily when all the other children you came with here have either been made into meals, corpses, or breeding stock. I gave you this happy life and the price of that has come due. Brakey's snarled. No, no, you have been kinder to me than any other master but still you and all these other slavers know nothing but to take and take. I'm free, you freed me, you can't take anything else from me. Naruto roared out in sudden explosive rage. Brakey's was stunned, he had known the boy had incredible amounts of untapped power. He knew of the child's bloodline and his connection to the god of flame. Still he couldn't have predicted such enormous power and such strength of will. It shouldn't have been possible he was a docile slave. He never showed any sign of rebellion but suddenly he revealed the will to resist. It didn't make sense. While he tried to understand how this was possible, Naruto only needed to understand that he did not wish to be devoured in such a way. In any way actually, he refused to submit to Brakey's. That meant, like all his pit fights, he needed to fight back. Asher and Beska had climbed through the window the moment Naruto began to scream in pain, but they weren't sure what to do. Suddenly the green lines of energy crawling across the boy's body receded and purple and black veins seemed to spread rapidly across the old man's body instead. Beska, what the fuck is happening right now? Asher asked his partner. I haven't got the foggiest idea. She replied staring at the scene before them. What the hell are you two doing in here? A thick voice asked causing both to turn to the Amazonian woman in the doorway. She glared at Tatu and began to reach for the black Dothraki Iraq handing at her hip. 
Asher and Beska were upon her in an instant and she was soon fighting a losing battle against two very skilled mercenaries. While they battled one another physically, the battle between Naruto and Brakies had picked up in intensity as well. Cease this instant, Brakies demanded, shut up. Naruto growled as he drove the mental construct of Brakies to his knees and began to absorb his knowledge. The ability to do so seemed to come naturally, almost like a pulling sensation as he began ripping knowledge and power from Brakies' form until only a small sliver remained. No, no, do you have any idea what you've done to me? The older man questioned as his emotions began to fade and a blank expression slowly came to his physical body's face. I have an idea, Naruto said as he captured the very soul of Brakies within his own mind and caged him deep within. Naruto, please, death is better than this. Brakies turned to begging as Naruto began to leave his mindscape. You have no idea how many slaves feel the same way, Brakies. I've seen your memories now. Hundreds of boys and girls like me. Taken again and again. Enslaved and then devoured. No more. Now it's your turn. Your spirit and body will serve me as long as I desire. Naruto said darkly as he left Brakies to scream in rage within his new prison. Suddenly Naruto was back in the small shop. Staring back at him were the lifeless eyes of the body that had once been his master. It simply stood there and stared. With a thought, Naruto sent the puppet walking backward until it leaned against the wall. That's unnatural, Asher said, bringing Naruto's attention to him as he turned to take in the appearance of his two friends as they cleaned Marina's blood off of their blades. Yeah, try experiencing it firsthand, Naruto said simply as he turned to look at the corpse puppet before him. Though he supposed it wasn't truly a corpse, still it was a puppet, an extension of himself and nothing more. This is weird. The body rasped as Naruto thought of speaking through its mouth. Asher and Beska shared uncomfortable looks, but at least their friend was alright, even if he was proving to be a little bit terrifying. As it was right now they had a lot they needed to discuss with one another. First though. So you're free now? Beska asked. Naruto blinked before grinning. He was free now. Free and even more than that. What are you going to do? Asher asked. I don't know. Maybe go home. It's been years but, Naruto mumbled. Home is home, Asher said knowingly. Yeah, Naruto commented. The trio was silent for a moment all staring at the odd puppet across from them. Slowly a smirk spread onto Naruto's face though. You two want to make some money? Naruto asked, looking over at them. Once more Beska and Asher shared a look. This time it was a little less troubled. There was nothing wrong with earning a bit of coin from someone you considered a friend after all. It was better actually because you could trust them to make good on the agreement. What's the job? Beska asked. Mantaris. Essos. 295 AC. The young couple had come to the small magister shop in the merchant quarter because everyone in this part of the city swore by the old man's ability with magic. Most folk who sold potions or spells or performed some sort of miraculous act were charlatans, here in Mantaris though magic was a much more real power. Brakies was said to be the real deal among the other spell weavers of the city. Some said that he had been in that same shop for decades, others said even longer. That was part of why the wealthy couple had come to him in the first place. Now though they felt less sure about getting a real fortune telling from the ancient man before them. His eyes were pale and foggy and his skin had a sickly grey look to it. Not to mention the smell, it was terrible. You want a fortune telling? Brakies asked them. Er, yes we do. The man started awkwardly trying not to cover his nose as Brakies stepped too close to him and his rancid breath washed over the poor man's face. We just want to know if our marriage will be a happy one with plenty of children. The woman said. Brakies stared at her before turning to look at the man again. He eyed them both for a while before his lips twitched grotesquely into a horrid smile. Oh is that all? He asked. Yes, I mean yes. How much would something like that cost? The man asked. The withered old man frowned for a moment before his face seemed to relax completely and he simply stared out into the street. The couple stared back at him for a few moments before turning to look at one another and slowly the man began to wave a hand in front of Braca's face. He continued to do that as he turned to look at his young bride and back to the old man whose face suddenly stretched into a grin before it slackened and the cloudy eyes turned to look at the man face to face. What are you doing? 
He asked the younger man. Oh, nothing, I will, it's just that you seem to slip off into your own world or something. He said. Brakey stared at him for a moment before huffing. I was thinking, perhaps you should try it some time. The man blinked at the sudden insult and opened his mouth to respond before a gray, clammy, finger pressed itself to his lips and silenced him. Be quiet, you wish for me to tell you your fortune, you must pay the price, Brakey said with a low tone. The man stepped back, letting the finger that had pressed against his mouth to fall back to Braca's side. How much? he asked. How much have you got? Brakey's asked before wincing from something. Er I mean, the more you are willing to sacrifice to me, the more I am willing to reveal to you. After all, the future is not something one should meddle with lightly. Brakey's declared. Uh, well we only have this much with us. The woman revealed her coin purse, a healthy amount laid in between, enough for a common family to eat for more than a week. That'll do. Brakey said as he snatched the bag and tossed it through the doorway to the living spaces of the shop. Now, let's see, Brakey began waving his hands before the pair for a moment and then freezing. Yes, yes I see. You will have a long fulfilling marriage with plenty of children but will sadly die unexpectedly. Brakey said. What do you mean unexpectedly? The man asked as he tightened his grip on his wife. Making the unexpected expected costs more. Now since you have no more money on yourselves kindly leave. Brakey said as he stood and made for the back entrance. Wait, that's it, the couple asked. I read your fortune, you are out of money. We have nothing more to discuss. Brakey said, before turning to them again. Now leave or I will have one of my servants send you off bloodied and bruised. Brakey said as the scarred and menacing looking Beska stepped into the room, looming over even the young man. Of course. Thank you for your time Master Brakey's. The young man said quickly as he dragged his young bride after him out of the ship. The pair watched them go before Brakey's went limp and once again stared off into space. Beska simply turned to look at Naruto and Asher as they came out of the back. Your puppet will work fine on people like them that didn't know the old bastard, but the neighbors and other people are starting to notice something weird. Beska commented as she started counting the coin. They are noticing Beska and me being around so often too, not to mention the fact that, what's her name, hasn't been around. Asher added in. Marina, her name was Marina, you're right though, it's only a matter of time before someone starts looking in at us to find out what's happened. Naruto admitted. Need a bit more work on using the puppet too. His face was kind of jerky and his voice came out funny. Asher continued. Yeah, I know, I'm still figuring this thing out. Naruto said with a shrug. What about the real breakies? Beska asked pointing at Naruto's head. Hey, even better than with the puppet. He still acts and sounds like the old man but he gave up trying to resist me some time ago, now he just answers whatever I ask with little issue. Naruto said with a shrug. I still don't like him being in there. I don't understand how it works really but couldn't he mess with your thoughts or actions or something? Asher asked. No. Naruto shook his head, technically this isn't even the same old man here either. The real Brakey's is dead. He just left behind a body that I can control with my intentions, and a copy of his knowledge, which happens to be in my head. If you say so, I can't help but still feel suspicious. Beska said. That, and very weirded out. Asher chirped getting a serious nod from Beska to confirm that point. Yeah, well I'm the one with him stuck in my head. Trust me. I know how weird this whole business is. I knew growing up that magic was strange though. And the stronger it is the more freakish it usually becomes. Naruto explained. Oh, how reassuring. Beska sarcastically stated. We do need to be moving on from Manteris soon. The woman said changing the subject. We will, I finally found what I was looking for. The company of the crow, are the ones that attacked my home. The ones that sold me and helped murder my family. Naruto said. Wait, murder your family. Are you sure they are even dead? From the story you told us, you were captured away from the town. Asher asked. I was, but the bastards were loose-lipped when they were dragging us to Manteris. Bragging about the easiest pay they'd ever earned. Then they actually met with the assassins that had hired them. They worked together in the past and evidently the assassin was a former member of the company. I burned their conversation into my memory. 
The whole attack was just so the assassins could get my family alone to murder them. Naruto's countenance darkened considerably as he spoke and the two mercenaries shared a look before Asher placed a hand on his shoulder to calm him back down. We're here to help you avenge yourself and your parents, Naruto. But we can't kill an entire mercenary company. Asher said somberly. He felt for the younger boy. Yes he might have been exiled and his family might still be alive but he could imagine the rage in his younger friend at the thought of what was done to his family and the injustice of being sold into slavery. Beska stared at the young man as well. She was once a slave herself and understood better than Asher could the hate Naruto felt toward the men who had sold him into that life. There was something else though. This isn't just about getting revenge on the ones that enslaved you or the assassins that killed your parents, though, is it? She asked. Naruto was quiet but slowly shook his head. I want the leader of the assassins alive. At least alive long enough to tell me who sent them. They are responsible too. He explained and both of his friends nodded. It isn't going to be easy, Naruto. Beska said. Since when have I given a shit about easy? He chuckled, getting her and Asher to smirk. Still, why not return to your people first? I mean no offense but they sound kind of like a cult and your family were like their chosen ones or something. Asher remarked becoming serious once more. I'll return to them eventually. I can't go back yet though. Not till after I reap my vengeance from the company of the crow. I could never leave my people without paying back my mother and father's deaths in blood and getting justice for my people's children who were stolen. Naruto explained. You were one of those children too, Naruto. Surely they would understand. Beska was uncharacteristically soft in her words. Maybe, but they will always wonder why it was that their children had to be lost forever while I wasn't, when I don't even have anyone to return to besides the town itself. Naruto argued back. Beska and Asher both doubted that. They knew it hung over Naruto that he had survived where the others had suffered terribly and succumbed to the life of a slave of Manteris. How will that change after you find a way to get revenge though? Asher asked. It won't but it's better to return with the heads of the men that took their children from them than empty-handed. Naruto said as he mentally commanded his puppet to return to the further interior of the shop. I can get that, I guess. But what exactly makes you think you can take on a whole mercenary company alone? I mean you are a tough son of a bitch and you can do some freaky shit with your magic but I don't think that would be enough. Asher pressed. Ah see, I have a plan for that, come on. Naruto replied before leading them into the shop and back up the flight of stairs to the magical workshop Breakies had. He stepped over to the desk and picked up a specific tome to show them. A book, Asher said blandly only to get a flick to his ear by Beska. Oh, I mean look, it's a book, ass. Beska rolled her eyes but the amused smile remained on her lips. You two are cute, really, but pay attention. Naruto said with an annoyed expression. Yeah, yeah, sorry get on with it. Asher groused. Naruto opened up the magical book and angled it so the other two could see it clearly. He flicked through the pages as multicolored glowing letters filled the pages and caught the interest of both Beska and Asher. Sadly that was about as far as their interest went as the letters meant just about nothing to the two of them. Hey, Naruto this is cool but it looks like some kind of messed up Valyrian. Beska pointed out, she could almost make some of it out but it wasn't right to her eyes. Ha, huh, messed up, no this is true Valyrian, er well old Valyrian. It's the proper format of the language. My parents taught me to read in this language before anything else. I can speak it too. Naruto explained as he stopped flipping through the pages when he stopped on a specific page with a diagram of the human body sketched alongside multiple sections of text. All right. So you know what it says, I assume this book has some sort of magic that comes with it otherwise I'm going to have some serious reservations about your so-called plan. Asher teased. The younger boy rolled his eyes at that before tapping the book. This is a complete volume dedicated to magical applications to healing the body, living and not so living. Naruto explained. Like your puppet? Beska asked. Pretty much. He was an accident more or less but Braka's old body will have its uses. Plus he's pretty much dead so he can't really be killed again, you know. Naruto explained. Wait, what? Asher asked in worry. Well he can but specific methods have to be used. Naruto defended. This magic stuff is creepy. Asher mumbled while his two friends ignored him. 
How does this help us though Naruto? Beska asked. I was getting to that. Right here on this page it talks about a series of magical spells and incantations to mend bones and knit flesh like cloth. Essentially healing injuries. Naruto translated a section beside the diagram. Okay. Beska urged him to continue. Well, what does Mantaris have lots of? Three guesses and the first two don't count. Naruto said cheekily. The two mercenaries sighed. Sometimes they forgot that despite everything Naruto was still a young boy in most regards. They stared blankly at him causing him to frown at their ruining of his moment. Some friends they were. Gladiator slaves, the answer is gladiator slaves. But more specifically abandoned gladiators. When someone loses most masters just leave them to die, which works because they have no way to pay for healing. Naruto further explained. And with this you could heal them for free and in no time at all. Asher realized as he and Beska's eyes widened. Exactly. All I ask is that they help me get my revenge then they can go off and do whatever they want or even come live in Nern. Make a new start and all that stuff. Naruto was giddy with his plan. It's a pretty good plan, but it's not without its risks too you know. Asher commented. Some of those gladiators might want to just stab you in the back the moment you help them. Beska agreed. Naruto chuckled as he clapped the book closed and set it back in its place. I'm no pushover. I am a former gladiator slave too. Naruto said with a cheeky smirk. Maybe so. But still, Beska began. But still I have my two friends to watch my back don't I? Naruto said glancing over his shoulder at them as he walked for the door. Both Beska and Asher were surprised how blatant he was being about trusting them with his life. That was something harder than gold to acquire, real trust. They couldn't stop the smile spreading on their own faces. Quelthalas, Sothorios, 295 AC. The trial was by and far too large for the typical venues of such an event. Normally such things were only needed for an individual or perhaps a single noble family or small collection of prisoners. Such things could easily be handled in the throne room then. As it stood the palace was barely standing. Even were it not undergoing complete reconstruction the building would not have sufficed for the sheer number of those being judged by the new ruler of the kingdom. That was not including the mass numbers of nobles, soldiers, and common folk all turning out to see the final act of the long-hated war. The trial of the false queen was therefore held out in the open air. A massive pavilion had been built and the Grand Bazaar cleared of all stands and kiosks. At the rear of the pavilion, on a raised platform, sitting atop an even further raised throne, sat the new king. Unlike most with the moniker, new kings he was far from a young man. He looked to be too old to have just taken his position but looks were often deceptive. Pretender Celebrian, you kneel now before me with your traitorous and corrupt subordinates, the self-proclaimed Keldore. In a show of my mercy, before all the people of Quelthalas, I give you an opportunity to recant your claim to the throne of this land. Save not only yourself but your followers as well. The old man proclaimed. Celebrian stared up from where she and her closest companions were chained to the platform at her formerly beloved uncle's feet. She knew how she would reply. So did he. It was rehearsed. All of this had been. After all her uncle was a man who planned everything he did to the finest detail. That was why she was chained up at his feet about to renounce her throne. He wanted to ensure he would be remembered as a fair and just king who had rescued their people. No one living in Quelthalas now would believe that. In a century though, two, more, perhaps Theron the usurper would instead be called Theron the just or even something as ludicrous as Theron the hero. She felt one of her dearest friends gently squeeze her hand to urge her into answering. They had struck a deal to give themselves at least a chance to survive. Their only chance no matter how slim. I hereby renounce any claim I have toward the throne of Quelthalas. Let all the people here be my witness that I have no desire to rule this land or even to remain in this land at all. Celebrian loudly announced, biting back tears at the fact she was turning her back on her father and family's legacy. I see, Theron loudly said, playing up his supposedly benevolent nature. Then I grant your wish. You and your followers must still be punished so it is fitting that I exile you. From here on the name Keldore will be that of those cast out from our verdant home. You shall be marked with a sign so that should you ever return you can be identified. As he said that, 
Celebrian and the rest of those shackled in the center of the market square hissed out in mild pain as a small red teardrop shape was magically seared into their wrists. With this mark given to you, never return here to Quelthalas, but go in peace. The king proclaimed before standing and walking off with his entourage of courtiers and nobles. One of his closest advisors leaned in closely to whisper with him in a hushed and worried tone. Your grace, wouldn't it be better to kill them now and be done with it? With Celebrian and her devotees gone none can challenge your claim to the throne again. The man pointed out, you don't think I already have, it would be a miracle for them to survive the Brindle men and make it to the coast. I also may have sent emissaries ahead of them to tell the tribes what is coming. The old man said simply walking ahead of his advisor. For Celebrian and her followers the soldiers of Quelthalas marched them to the river where a large number of ships from skiffs to galleys to barges had been arranged for them to take down river and eventually to the northern coast of the continent. She watched her people, numbering just over 500 in total, board the vessels while their guards watched diligently. We leave behind weakness and stagnation, Celebrian. Sylvanas, one of her two hands reassured her. Perhaps one day we will be reunited again and the people will have realized that the usurper has misled them. Leodrin, Celebrian's other hand, said. Leodrin, your hope is misplaced, again. This country is nothing but a land of traitors. We'll build something greater for our people in the ruins of the dragon lands to the north. We just have to push past the savages between here and the sea. Sylvana's typically sharp tongue commented. Leodrin scowled at her friend. All three had grown up together and cared for one another greatly but Sylvanas and Leodrin disagreed more often than they agreed, with Celebrian acting as the mediator for the two on multiple occasions. She rarely had to actually speak to end their quarreling. Especially right now, a look and wave of the hand silenced both younger women as they realized their mistress was in no mood. Sylvanas, is your family aboard already? Celebrian asked. Yes. My sisters managed to get what remained of our family's heirlooms packed away before that show. The ranger said with a sneer aimed toward the distant palace looming over the city. Then it is time to depart. Celebrian said simply as she walked down toward the ships herself and across the gangplank to the lead vessel. Leodrin and Sylvanas stopped to take a final look back at their homeland. Sylvanas for but a moment, while Leodrin stared sadly at her former home. Even after having been ravaged by a near decade of warfare it remained a beautiful place. Separated from the lands of humanity by the savage Brindle men in the north, Quelthalas was untouched by nearly all outside interaction or interference. The only exception having been one called Genera Baileries long before any living elf of Quelthalas had been born. The empire of dragons and their riders had fallen so long ago now that even it predated any of their people. Still, it was the few stories told by Genera to the royal family and their historiographers that Celebrian and the Keldore hoped to rely upon to find a new home. Some place beyond the brutal jungles between them and the northern's coasts. Slowly Leodrin sighed and turned her back on her home to join with Sylvanas and Celebrian. She prayed that they would not suffer too great of hardships on their journey. After all that her people had been through, they could surely use some divine support for the difficult days ahead. Leodrin would never be able to imagine the journey she and her people were about to embark upon. Even more so, they could not imagine the future that awaited them, nor the role they would play in shaping the fate of the world. Mantares, Essos, 295 AC. Bracca's small shop had proven to be too small for Naruto's growing band of former gladiators. It had taken some weeks but slowly he had begun to secure the loyalty of more and more of his fellow former slaves by saving them from the jaws of certain death. They had been forced to purchase a larger residence within the city as they built their group up, which had sadly gained the attention of much of the city's ruling class. When they began to look in on what they still assumed to be Bracca's actions they began to worry even more as they noticed he had collected a force of more than 30 experienced warriors to his side and that wasn't including Naruto, Asher, and Beska each of which were given a healthy amount of respect for their own skill in a fight. It's too bad the Nestio's triplets tried to pull a fast one. They were pretty skilled too, Beska said as she cleaned her blades up. Yeah, they were the last ones down in gatehouse slums to recruit too. Asher commented. It's becoming harder and harder to find people to recruit. Naruto joined the conversation as he finished putting away his book of healing spells. That, my young friend, 
would be because all of the masters have started catching on to what we've been up to. I told you buying this place was a bad idea. I mean we were planning on leaving as soon as we had enough fighters anyway so this seems like it was a bad idea. The older male of the trio said. I had to. I can't expect these people to want to follow me if I'm making them live in the street. Naruto argued. Maybe, but now every eye in the city is watching to see what you, or rather what Breakies is going to do next. The masters are getting paranoid and everyone is on edge. Asher pressed. They don't know you are running things which is good, but they also assume Breakies is planning some kind of power play. Any moment now they'll be coming here to see what their fellow master is intending. If they aren't satisfied, we will be lucky to make it to the city gates let alone out of the city itself. Beska said. The two males frowned at that. She wasn't wrong. They were pretty close to the force Naruto wanted to use to attack the company of the crow, but taking on one of the free cities in their home turf. That was suicide. How many more do we need before we set out Naruto? I hate to add even more bad news but as much as Breakies had saved up it's been running out pretty quickly since we bought this place. We still need to think of arming and feeding everyone. Asher added. Naruto frowned and leaned over the table. He was close to making the first big step toward writing what he felt was a crooked path. Ever since Burn was attacked those years ago and he was taken away it felt like the world had just been wrong, like it was set upon a mistaken path. His chance to finally fix it was so close but with the way things were going in the city it might slip away from him at any moment. From some of the traveling merchants I had the puppet deal with I learned that the crows are recovering from a hard set of defeats. Most of their troops are dead but they still have more than double our numbers. Naruto said. Hey, listen, we understand that, we aren't saying to abandon the goal, but maybe we need to come up with another method to recruit people and leave Manteris before things get hairy here. Asher argued. It might be too late for that. Beska called over from her place beside the window. Naruto and Asher joined her as they looked down across the small courtyard of the old estate. At the warped and rusted gates stood a pair of former gladiators that had been essentially appointed as sentries. They squared off with a large number of Manteri's soldiers who seemed to be escorting a handful of slaves bearing a litter carrying a small frail looking man and two barely clad women. They recognized the man. One of the wealthiest in Manteris he owned the majority of the pleasure houses in the city as well as the House of Horrors locally called the Breeding Stall, where slaves were produced and sold like cattle on a daily basis. Balio, Naruto said darkly as he stared at the man below them. He's no doubt here at the behest of the rest of the masters. He's powerful but more like the lackey for the real powerful families. Beska commented. True enough, still it's best we go down and meet with him. Maybe we can buy ourselves some more time, Naruto said as he turned and headed for the door. Twenty pieces of silver that Balio does something to piss him off and he kills him. Asher said as he turned to Beska. That's a given, how about this, I bet he does something to one of his slaves then Naruto kills him for it. Beska countered. Hum, alright I bet that Balio tries something with Najer. She was his prized gladiator till that fight last month. I heard he initially planned to use her for himself after her time in the arena but with her unable to walk, Asher said. Shit, you're probably right. The moment he sees her up and around he's going to do something that will piss Naruto off. Beska groaned. Yep, you could always pay me now and keep your shame between the two of us. Asher joked. PFF'd as if. Just get ready to fight, Asher. She said as they followed after Naruto. When am I not? He grinned. He was almost looking forward to the negotiations falling apart. Almost of course. Naruto himself made his way down to the gate instead of sending breakies. He doubted the puppet would be useful as a mask for him running the show much longer anyway. Especially as he approached the hat and the former gladiators who had begun to gather there moved aside for him with murmurs of the moniker Master Healer or Lord Healer. That was who he had become to them. Healer, or Master Healer of some variety or other. He was a bit embarrassed by the name, especially as the fact he had not healed these people with pure intentions. He planned to use them, but that didn't mean he didn't care for them. They had become his responsibility the moment they took the deal he had offered them. Boy, where is the master Breakies? Do you not belong to him? Balio called down as Naruto stepped up to the gate. I belong to no one. Breakies freed me some weeks ago. 
Naruto said as he placed a hand on one of the gate guard's shoulders to calm him down. Oh how very fascinating, Balio said with rolling eyes, he didn't care about the life and freedom of some child even if he had lost a small fortune in the pits betting against him. Where is Breakey's at? I am here representing a collection of concerned masters of the city including the magistrate. It is in his best interest to welcome me in. Balio continued. Forgive me fair master but were you invited by Breakey's? Naruto asked coyly, causing the man to stare sourly at the boy. The gladiators each smirked while the collection of slaves quailed under the clear displeasure Balio now displayed. He snapped his fingers and the litter was lowered to the ground before he stepped forward to the gate himself. Naruto imagined it was supposed to be an imposing action, one meant to show Naruto had offended a powerful man and he had turned his full attention onto him. Instead it amounted to a fully grown man who was only a few scant inches taller than the young adolescent coming to stand before him. If the differences between the two hadn't been clear earlier, now as they stood literally side by side, Balio and Naruto showed just how different they were. The master was a grown man but short and slight like a boy. He had tastes for both men and women and liked to imagine himself as a middle point between the two. In actuality his drail figure, pale skin, and terrible complexion simply showed how wealthy and vain he was. In comparison Naruto had become big for his age. The need to strengthen himself for his fights had made that imperative, but he was still just slightly more than a child. His tanned and muscled physique matched with plenty of scars and a well-fitted outfit capable of providing marginal protection in a fight all made him look far more mature and intimidating than the little master thought himself to be. Open this gate and take me to Breakey's. Balio sneered, or I will have it opened and have your throat opened up next. Naruto's eyes hardened and for a brief second the guards around Balio tensed before a soft expression fell onto the young man's face. Of course, please forgive the inconvenience. I care much for my former master and wanted to make sure you have no ulterior motives toward him, is all. Naruto said while bowing his head slightly. Balio snorted but nodded, he wished his men were as dutiful. Anytime the magistrate or other more intimidating masters came calling at his residence the doors seemed to open themselves for their entourages. Still Breakey's should know better than to try and resist him and the other masters. He was a washed up old man who made his money on parlor tricks. Slowly the gate opened and Balio and his group were admitted in. They were led through the courtyard to a small garden area with high raised walls surrounding it before Naruto followed by Asher and Beska all stood across from Balio and the guards. The guards shifted awkwardly as they realized things had suddenly changed. At the gate Naruto and a handful of former gladiators stood on the other side of a gate but here the whole of Naruto's group had become present sitting around the sides of the garden or up on the top of the walls looking down. Where earlier their small numbers seemed imposing, now they were clearly outnumbered and surrounded. Balio, however, seemed to care little for that fact. I said to bring me to your master boy. Where is he? Balio snapped as he was set down by his slaves. And I told you, Balio, that I have no master. Naruto snarled back his brief submissiveness long gone. The master was taken back by the sudden reaction. Before he could reply though Naruto stepped forward as did the multitude of gladiators pressing in tightly against the small group. You may have wished to speak with Breakies, but you now see he is not in charge here. I am. Now what is it you want? If you are here to extort me, you are poorly prepared for it, and we will be leaving shortly anyway so you'll find that pointless. Naruto spoke calmly and clearly. Leaving. Balio paused suddenly. Yes, we'll be leaving. All we need to do now is purchase supplies for the journey and we'll be leaving Manteris behind. Naruto said, causing the master to blink as he thought over the boy's words. He opened his mouth finally seeming ready to accept that Naruto and his band of leftovers would be out of their hair until his eyes locked onto his former slave. Najer stared back with disgust and hatred in her eyes, but Balio's filled with desire. Not one that a man might have for a woman typically, but one he might have for a delicious meal or a child for a toy. There was a tinge of madness in his stare as he simply gazed at Najer. Finally tearing his eyes away from the woman he faced Naruto once again. It's all well and good you wish to leave the city. First though, the property you have collected does not belong to you. Property, Naruto grumbled, knowing what the man was about to suggest. Yes, property, 
return the slaves to their proper owners or purchase them and then be on your way boy. Balio said as he turned to step back onto his litter. Naruto sighed before shaking his head. He nodded at the gladiators and in a single moment the guards that had accompanied Balio collapsed either dead or drowning in their own blood as a mix of arrows and blades tore them apart. You wretch, what is the meaning of this? Balio screamed as he turned to face Naruto again. Be silent, it's obvious, you'll be leaving here alive. Go back to your own masters and the magistrate and tell them we will be leaving as soon as we collect our supplies. Your former slaves are now forfeit. Naruto hissed, causing Balio to take a step back. Balio tightened his fists but wisely bit his tongue before being roughly escorted to the gate once again by one of the gladiators at another nod from Naruto. The others stepped forward to free the slaves that Balio had brought with him and give some clothes to the women while Asher and Beska both approached Naruto wanting to know what exactly he was thinking at the moment. Was it a good idea to let Balio walk out of here like that? Asher asked. They know we will be heading for the market now. It's going to be crawling with soldiers. Beska said. Not yet it won't be. Just the guards already there will be present. We will reach the merchant quarter before Balio reaches the other masters. Naruto explained. So what, are we going to go haggle for supplies while Balio and the rest lead the army into the merchant quarter to butcher us all? Beska asked scathingly. No, we aren't haggling for shit. We are going to go in and take what we want. Kill the masters and free the slaves. Then we are going to burn it to the ground. Naruto calmly said, catching both by surprise. Naruto, you want to burn the merchant quarter down, fine. Just don't do it while we are trapped in the city. I'll follow you to the end building an army and sacking this shithole if you want, but I won't commit suicide for you. Asher said resolutely. I'd never ask you to. Neither of you. The merchant quarter is one district from the gatehouse slums. If we can fight our way there the army won't be able to fight with us in those narrow passages and we can take the gatehouse and leave. Naruto explained. That's if we can take it. Beska commented. It's our best chance. I won't turn my back on the people we have gotten to come with us. I won't send them back into slavery. Naruto growled at the end. The two mercenaries sighed but nodded. They understood that, and truth be told this was the only real option they had. Fine, I'll get everyone around. You two had best get all the magical shit you want to bring packed into the saddle bags with the pack horses. Beska said before heading over to where the gladiators were still lending a hand to the newest recruits. Come on Asher, we can't spare any time. Most of my things are packed but we still have a bit to do and this is going to be a very busy day. Naruto called over his shoulder as he raced up the stairs. Within less than an hour Naruto was leading his group into the merchant quarter. Or more like marching into the merchant quarter. The guards were smart enough to realize something was going on and moved to meet them in the middle of the street. That had been a mistake. The half dozen soldiers were easily outnumbered and overwhelmed causing the crowds to watch in shock as the soldiers were butchered in the street. Using the brief shocked silence to his advantage Naruto scaled a low wall to stand just over the heads of the people in the street. He took a single moment to pause and look out over the crowd easily picking out the slaves, freedmen, and masters among them. Those of you bound to a master, rejoice. Your time spent as a slave ends today. Those of you who bind others to your bidding, weep. Your time spent among the living ends now. Naruto bellowed out, and in an instant chaos erupted. Naruto's gladiators swept into the crowd and stuck down masters left and right. Shops were torn apart and goods rapidly stuffed into all manner of carrying bag. Screams quickly began to fill the streets as Naruto's forces spread further and further into the merchant quarter and seemed to swell in number by the dozens as more and more slaves were freed or took up arms against their masters and freed themselves. The leader himself joined in, beside Beska and Asher as they slew a handful of bodyguards for one elderly master before letting his own slave boy finish him by crashing a large pot over she head and stomping on him. From the snippets they could gather from his screaming, the man had done something similar to the boy's mother in the past. They let him be and continued their raid on the merchant quarter burning shops and slaughtering any that didn't join their cause. Naruto, the men can't get into that smithy because they barred themselves in. They managed to kill a couple of ours too, Asher said pointing the shop out. The younger fighter frowned, they would need the weapons inside as well as anything else they had of value. 
He motioned for Beska and Asher to follow him as they approached the doorway where a pair of his gladiators were trying their best to break the thick door down with a pair of axes. Ho, oh, stand back, Naruto called out as he approached the obstacle. Both of the men quickly stepped out of the way and joined the small collection of freed slaves that had paused in their raiding of the merchant's stalls and shops to watch their leader work. You have not practiced with that spell enough, Naruto. It may prove too costly for you at the moment. Brakies warned. Having been bound to Naruto, the fragment of the old man was completely loyal to his master now. At least as far as Naruto could tell at the moment. I know, but we need those weapons. The two shops we looted already weren't enough. There were a lot more slaves in the merchant quarter than I expected today. Naruto replied before slowly bending down to grasp a stone to rub between his hands. He blew out a small breath of air, buzzing with unnatural purplish energy onto the stone and felt his body weaken from the action. With a flick of the wrist he watched as the small sparkling rock lazily sailed through the air before encountering the doorframe and suddenly detonating in a sizable explosion. From inside there was a series of terrified shouts and the screams of someone being injured, while the door bent and snapped, it remained mostly intact. The frame holding it however had been reduced to splinters and the wall beside it was cracked and smoking. Asher and Beska recognized the tired look on their friend's face as he slumped slightly and they quickly moved to his side to support him while the rest of the group surged forward and slammed into the weakened doors, knocking them off of their hinges and tumbling into the shop. The short sounds of a fight escaped, but none of the shop's residents did. Soon the raiders returned laden down with a large selection of blades, hammers, and other weapons as well as several helmets and other smaller pieces of armor which were quickly claimed by various freed slaves. Soon the fighting began to diminish and focus turned solely to looting as the last of the masters either died or escaped into other parts of the city. Naruto and his people had to move quickly as they loaded down pack animals and several carts with everything they could carry. The slaves collected in the main market as Naruto stepped up onto the platform once used to auction slaves. Behind him Asher and Beska held down the two surviving masters that still yet lived within the merchant quarter. Everyone, Naruto hollered, gathering attention onto himself. The freed slaves quieted but still murmured among one another as Naruto stood before them. He released a calming breath before his features hardened into a confident and serious look. Everyone, you are free now. Free to do as you please. That won't last long though. Even now as we speak the city's army is already marching this way. They would have had all the time they needed to regroup so any moment now they will march into this part of the city and put us all to the sword, if we are lucky. Naruto continued. The group's murmuring began to pick up faster and louder. I have a solution. Naruto called out, stalling the panic from taking hold of them all. Myself and my followers will be leaving this hellish city. I ask that you follow me as well. Work together and help me to lead us all out of this terrible place. Either back home or to a new home. Someplace we can be free and happy once again. Naruto called out getting supportive shouts from his gladiators and gradually from the other slaves too. Excellent. Now, together we have a real chance. First we must prepare to defend ourselves. If we can break their first assault, they will be forced to try and talk us into surrender. So begin the construction of a barricade. Block every path into the merchant quarter and prepare yourselves to fight for your lives and your freedom. He shouted and the people quickly began scrambling to do just as he had said. Asher and Beska shared a glance before looking at Naruto. That wasn't the plan. Asher pointed out simply. The plan has to change look there. Naruto said as he pointed in the direction of the path they had planned to use to escape Mantaris. Between them and their chance at survival was the slowly marching shield wall of Mantaris soldiers. At their current pace they would take a considerable amount of time, as they had to march down a hill before scaling the hill that led to the merchant quarter. Still as they marched their numbers grew and grew, steadily as more and more soldiers from across the city joined them. They expected that route. They sent their troops there to cut us off before we ever had a chance, Asher said sadly. Exactly, I have a few ideas, but all that matters now is we find a way to beat back this first assault. If we can do that we still have a chance, Naruto said before turning to look at the two prisoners. He wondered if they thought he planned to use them as bargaining chips or something like that. He had no intention of doing that though. Instead he recalled the darker sections of the tome he had read and stepped over to them, placing a hand on the side of the first man's face. They both looked confused until a light swirled around the man's head and he began to panic. 
It was over in a moment though as his eyes rolled into the back of his head before falling back onto the ground. The second looked confused and terrified. He could only scream as Naruto reached over to repeat the process on him as well. Again it was over in a mere moment but the effects were clear. Both men were dead but Naruto himself was rejuvenated. It felt as though he had gotten a full night's worth of deep sleep and was well rested before also having a large hearty breakfast. What the hell? Beska asked in mild fear toward her friend's actions. More freaky magic shit. Asher frowned slightly before shaking his head. Just don't ever use that on use, if you please. Wouldn't dream of it. Naruto grinned as he felt his energy bubbling inside him. With the recharge he set about healing all of the former slaves in their little revolt that he could. Just as Naruto said, soon a massed force of hundred of Mantari's soldiers began their assault on the rudimentary barricades the revolting slaves had erected around the merchant quarter. They barked out in unison with every step, mimicking the lockstep legions of past empires such as the Gaskari or even the far more disciplined and skilled Unsullied. That all being said, these Mantari's guardsmen didn't come close in comparison to the far more skilled and effective forces they imitated. In truth, they were trained in such a way for suppressing slave revolts due to the intimidating nature of a large armored force of soldiers moving in unison while shouting and barking out gruff refrains. It was an effective strategy, at least in most circumstances. However as they neared the small walls of debris erected by the freed slaves, the poorly disciplined rank and file of guardsmen began to fall apart. Those gladiators gifted with bows easily picked apart the commanders leading their men and the soldiers that remained had to separate their shield wall to try and scale the barricade. A suicidal task as spears, blades, and any other kind of weapon was brought to bear on them while they struggled for their footing to defend themselves. Most of the guards had never truly fought anyone. The hordes of the Dothraki were bought off and slave revolts were usually small and easily disrupted, not to mention poorly armed. Naruto had been smart in taking over the merchant quarter and acquiring weapons for his people. It tipped the balance in their favor as the soldiers stumbled into their own deaths at the hands of defiant gladiators, laborers, pleasure slaves, and more. At the forefront Naruto, Asher, and Beska led their people in fighting off the attack. It was bloody, and in a few places the guardsmen briefly broke through only to be overwhelmed by the revolters' numbers. Still not all the casualties were had by the guardsmen. Easily a hundred slaves fell as the fighting drug on throughout the afternoon. Eventually though the guardsmen broke and fell back to a second series of barricades. These were erected by the guardsmen of the city when they realized that victory was not going to be as easy of a task as they had previously thought. While the guardsmen fell back to lick their wounds, Naruto took a chance to heal those he could among his own rank, draining nearly a dozen captured guardsmen to keep himself going. Asher and Beska took in the sight of their battle and knew that a second push from the army would probably be their end. They needed to do something different because a siege was most definitely not going to end in their favor. Before they could even approach Naruto about it though, he surprised them by sending his puppet out. The elderly Brakies crossed the space between the two groups with an ease and speed one his age should not possess. He strolled over the corpses of dead Mandarin's soldiers without a second glance and stopped just beyond the hastily constructed positions of the army before him. The guards watched him curiously as he strolled up without any fear or worry. Meanwhile Asher and Beska were distracted from the actions of the puppet when Naruto walked up to them. I have figured it out, Naruto said, getting their attention. What? Asher asked. How to get out of here of course. You won't like it but it will work, Naruto explained. Both of the older members of the trio bit their lips as they realized another ambitious strategy was about to be unveiled. Like before though, they had no real choice but to follow along. The only other option seemed to be to wait and die. Don't give me those looks. It will work, I swear, I've already got people moving actually. That caught both of them by surprise. What do you mean? Beska asked. We're using the catacombs, Naruto said, causing both of their eyes to widen. The catacombs are a death trap. Asher hissed. For small groups or individuals, there's nearly 300 people about to pass through them. Naruto argued. Yeah, maybe but some will still get picked off or get lost in there. We will be lucky to make it out of the other end with half of us still alive. Asher continued to argue back. Asher, it's better than all of us just dying here. Beska interjected. Wait, what? You're buying into this madness. Asher asked. He'd heard the stories of the catacombs of this city. 
Anyone who had been here had. Manteries was a place of deformed monsters kept as pets by their masters. Many slaves were fed to them every day in a grotesque celebration of the vile debauchery that persisted in Manteries. The catacombs were worse. Those creatures too terrible even for the masters to want on their leash were forced into the darkness below the city. A great number of slaves were forced in after them on a weekly basis with the full understanding that the monsters below would feed on them. It was originally some sort of simple-minded defensive decision. Making the method of flanking the city's defenses worse than a head on assault. Now though it was simply another part of the horror of Manteries. I would rather die from a sword or something like that than whatever is lurking down there. Asher argued. Yeah, so would we, but if we stay we are definitely going to die from a sword or the like. If we go through there, we have a chance. A real chance, Asher. Naruto said while staring into his friend's eyes. The older boy stared back at Naruto for a time, both locking their gazes and communicating silently all their worries about the situation. In the end, as was quickly becoming typical, Asher realized, he sighed and submitted to Naruto's plan. How it was the boy had essentially become their leader he wasn't sure. They were friends but there was a charisma to Naruto perhaps just in his body language that made those around him feel comforted and reassured. There was more to it though. Asher and Beska had both realized by now they were fully committed to backing their younger friend. Somewhere along the lines the border between leader and friend had blurred and it was never going to go back. How close till everyone is, underground? Asher asked. Not long now. I sent Brakies to talk with them to try and buy time. The puppet is creeping them out though. They realized it's not really Brakey's so I've just been calling him my voice now. Naruto said as he looked out over the barricade toward the opposing side. Your voice? Beska asked. Yeah, what? Naruto asked, noticing the looks. I dunno if that's pretentious or adorable. Asher said with a grin spreading across his face. It's both. Adorably pretentious maybe. Beska said as she joined in on the teasing. Naruto huffed, though grinned faintly. They had needed something to relax for a moment. A brief bout of teasing was just the necessary thing as they felt a little bit of the day's stresses leave their bodies. Master Healer, Nagar called catching their attention. Yes? Naruto asked as he became serious once again. We've gotten all of the non-combatants into the catacombs and have started slowly sending the gladiators and fighters in as you ordered. There's only around 30 of us left to go now, she responded. Excellent, we are going even faster than I expected. Naruto said happily. That joy turned sour as he snapped his head back to look at the Manteries' defensive lines. What is it, Naruto? Asher asked. The distraction is over. They're going to be coming soon. One of them just stabbed my puppet in the chest. Naruto said with a frown. Oh yeah? What was that like? Asher asked. Fine I guess. Didn't bother me at all, and the puppet isn't alive so it didn't even bleed. Really seemed to disturb the masters though. They all started screaming about witchcraft and things like that. Naruto explained as his undead puppet began returning to them. Really? They do all sorts of dark magic on slaves and this is too much for them? Asher asked. Probably has something to do with the fact that it's a dead man walking. Their magic only ever does things to the living. Not, that. Beska pointed out as the puppet returned with a little more than just the knife to the chest Naruto had mentioned. They shot you in the head. Asher commented with a snort at the sight of an arrow sticking out where the puppet's left eye should have been. Yeah, I'll have to find him a replacement cause I can't see out of its left side anymore. Later though. Let's get out of here before they get their shit together and launch another assault. Naruto commanded, leading his companions to rejoin the others in retreating into the catacombs beneath the city. Balio raged as he stepped into the wreckage of the merchant quarter alongside his fellow masters and the magistrate. Corpses littered the area and the district was in ruins. Soldiers milled about checking the bodies finding no survivors left behind by either side. They had been so confident. What could a ragtag band of unruly slaves really hope to accomplish? Freedom lied just beyond the gates surely, but the gates were out of reach for them the moment Balio had told the magistrate that the boy, Naruto and his little band of misfits was planning on some sort of revolt. He hadn't known they were going to torch the merchant district but it was obvious enough they were planning to try and escape. The fact that they managed to do so, even after all the real avenues out of Manteris had been closed off was vexing, until their soldiers had shown them the entryways to the city's old catacombs. The fact the boy had fled through them was shocking itself. 
It also expressed just how desperate they were to get away. I must give the boy and his followers some credit. To willingly go into those depths, the magistrate said with a bored tone as he stared at the entryway to the underground. The soldiers outright refused to follow. If we hadn't lost so many against the rebels earlier then maybe they would have pursued, but as it is their pride is already in shambles. Another master commented. It matters little. I don't know what that foolish child hopes to accomplish down there. There is no escape from the underground of Mantaris. Even should they find a way to avoid being devoured or violated by the creatures under our feet, they'll never find an end to that labyrinth. Yet another added in. Hum, still. Post soldiers at every entrance we know of. No doubt some will break faith when they find true horror down there. We'll make an example of all of those that try to return the way they left. The magistrate ordered before signaling for his litter to be lifted and hauled away. One by one the other masters followed in the magistrate's actions eventually leaving only Balio, with a new litter and set of slaves to stare at the dark maw of the underground catacombs in impotent rage. The catacombs of Mantares had been just as the rumors said. Horrifying dark, miserable, and full of death. The difference between Naruto's groups and those in the past was that Naruto was leading a group of over a hundred people through the tunnels. Creatures that spurred nightmares were overwhelmed and torn apart by their fighters, and cooperation kept their losses to the confusing layout to a minimum. A minimum. Asher and Beska both had praised him for his genius and leadership as they began to emerge a distance a ways from Mantaris into the hills further inland. He would have normally loved being praised in such a way, he would have been embarrassed, of course, but he would have loved it. Less than thirty people had died in the catacombs. The people praised him as well. His title of Master Healer, simply Master, our Lord, was stuck now it seemed. Still, he had gotten them all into that situation and because his original plan backfired they had to go through the catacombs in the first place. He wasn't stupid or so self-loathing as to pin the blame truly on himself. After all, the masters of Mantares were the most to blame. They had them as slaves to begin with. They created and fed those monsters as well. They also pushed them into a corner where their only option had been to flee through the dark tunnels. He felt almost the same hate for them as the company of the crow. With that simple realization his goals began to shift and change. His dreams to return home and lead his people after gaining their revenge remained but, how could he stop at that? The citizens of Nern were not his only people anymore. He wasn't so foolish to believe he could fins and save every slave in the world, but his parents had impressed upon him time and again that he was meant to do something extraordinary. He was beginning to get an idea of just what that might be. Kalapitra village Essos 295 AC Naruto watched over the small village as it burned. Pillars of smoke drifted into the air and he couldn't help the slight guilt that wormed its way into his heart. He told himself that he had to do what he could to feed and clothe those that followed him they were his responsibility. He told himself that if those following him were his responsibility then that meant that those that stood against him were his enemies. If they refused his offer to join his group or surrender goods then he didn't really have a choice. The alternative was his own people starving. They're getting better at this sort of thing. It'll get them ready for facing the mercenaries when we get to them. Plus we needed the food and supplies. Asher said, knowing what Naruto was thinking about. He knows that Asher. Beska said. She was a bit on edge with what they were doing these days, but she, like Asher was pragmatic enough that she knew this was for their survival. I was just trying to help Beska. I don't want him acting more broody than he already does. Asher said with a shrug. Naruto would have chuckled at their banter, he knew that was what they were trying to get him to do, but as he heard some woman down below them screaming for her son who had been killed he couldn't force a smile onto his face. The best he could do was keep up his blank uninterested look as he stared down at the village. Send word down. Wrap this up. I want to move out soon and we still need to haul our new supplies back to camp. Naruto instructed his friends before returning to the horse he had liberated from another village a few days prior. He rode back with Beska beside him. Asher having gone to give out his orders. They made it back to camp quickly enough and those not actively working as soldiers for their little band greeted them once they made it back. They weren't in very high spirits though. None of them were especially thrilled about being no better than bandits. Probably because most had found themselves bound up in slavery due to some band of brigands not too dissimilar from Naruto's own. The difference was Naruto took no slaves. He didn't really need to. Even after their losses and many of the people he had recruited in Mantaris deciding to go their own way, 
he had well over a hundred fighters with another fifty or so people that effectively acted as camp followers. That was the better way to think of their group. Not a nomadic band of reavers but an army on campaign. One that drew ever closer to its objective. One that was no different than the other armies of the world that burned its way through the landscape as it hunted its enemy. He wasn't the first to raid the coast of the Sea of Sighs. He could be the last though. Over the last few months of time he had gradually formulated a new dream. After all he was always a single battle and interrogation from returning to Nern and his people. Hopefully. From what he understood the town was still there. He just hoped the people wouldn't try and keep him away. Nern was his by right after all. He didn't want to have to harm his people to remind them of that fact. That thought caused him to pause. He focused on it and ran it through his mind again and again. He hadn't ever really worried that they would refuse him when he returned. Or at least he never considered it realistically or what he would do in response. However he knew what he would do. He hated that he knew what he would do, but he did. After all, his parents had made it clear when he was a boy he was meant for something, and his right to Nern and this band of freed slaves, no this band of warriors, would form the foundation for that greatness that they envisioned for him. Are you alright? Beska suddenly asked him. Excellent. Really? Just a bit tired of having to raid for supplies. I didn't realize just how much a hundred people ate and drank. Or how slow they moved. Naruto replied. Beska snorted in amusement but nodded. Welcome to the life of a commander Naruto. I can't wait till you are trying to rule when we get to that little town of yours. It's going to be something. Har har, Beska. I'll have you know I was raised to rule. Specifically that, little town of mine, too. You'll see. I may be new to this whole leading an army thing but once I'm running the show in Nern everything will go smoothly. Naruto said confidently. Aha. Uh -huh. Well, at least you'll have me, Asher, and about a hundred of the most loyal fighters on the continent to pull your pompous ass out of the fire once you mess up royally. She said with a grin. Bah. You'll see. Then I think I'll make you call me something like boss, or maybe chief. Oh I like that. Beska from now on call me chief. Naruto said childishly as he dismounted outside his tent getting the woman to roll her eyes, though she was plenty amused by his antics. Naruto could play up a childish facade when he wanted to relax from a stressful event. It conflicted so much with his usual demeanor that the first few times he had done it everyone had been a bit worried something had happened to him, like all the siphoning of people's lives to heal himself or recover had hurt his mind somehow. Then again that could still have been happening they just weren't as worried about it anymore. Beska wisely decided not to think about how Naruto using magic to suck the life out of other people and heal his followers as well as the stinking corpse of a puppet he kept around as a shite diplomat was now just normal for her. So, where next? She asked him as she followed him into his tent. Naruto hummed as he walked over to the small light table they had arrayed a series of maps out on. He traced a finger from Manteris to the approximate location they were now camped out in, a short distance from Kalapitra. We're here he said, before tracing a slightly longer line over to the approximate location of their eventual destination. The semi-permanent residents of the mercenary company he wished to have words with. They're here, and between us are a few dozen villages just like this one. Thankfully they lost so many men recently. They'll stay where they are, fattening up like a pig getting ready to be butchered. Meanwhile our force is just getting tougher and nastier. Naruto said with a faint grin at the thought of wreaking vengeance on the mercenaries that had sold him into slavery all those years ago. Beska nodded looking most specifically at the path between their camp and the next village. It would be a couple weeks, since a lot of the group still lacked horses and they couldn't fit them all on carts and still carry their supplies. It might be cutting it close on their supplies really. We'll need to set up some hunting parties, or something at least, just to pad out our supply situation. She pointed out. Good idea. We could have done that before, but the villages were closer together the closer you get to Mantaris. They are starting to be more spaced out now. He said as he looked over their route on the map. Exactly. We also need to ration a bit better. There's going to be grumbling but we can't let anything go to waste. Beska pointed out. How do you know all this about running an army? Really it's very helpful but kind of surprising too. Naruto said. Beska snorted. You should get it. I'm a mercenary. Well, I guess I was a mercenary until my idiot partner introduced me to this smart ass kid with all this weird shit around him. Sounds like bad news. Naruto said jokingly though his eyes brightened as she confirmed her loyalty to him. Oh, he is the worst news. 
Thankfully I think I'm on his good side. Like a big sister or something. She said with a grin before she realized what she had said and both of them stared at one another in open shock. The pair of former slaves remained silent as they both contemplated the concept of them being siblings. While Asher was gone, he was easily a part of their little group as well. Clearly. Still, to be like siblings. Officially proclaiming that. It was a new feeling. Beska. Do you really think of me like, Naruto began quietly. As a family, yeah sure. She interrupted him awkwardly while scratching at the back of her neck. Emotions and discussing them was not something she was really comfortable with. Naruto wasn't much better. Naruto stared up at the taller woman intently until she reached out to lightly rub his head. Don't dwell too much on it I guess. You're mine and Asher's baby brother. So we have to look out for you and show you the ropes I guess. She teased. Naruto snorted at the thought. Let's not bring this up to Asher. He'll be insufferable. The boy said. Oh I am bringing it up the first chance I get. I can't wait till I watch him try to bring it up with you. She snickered. Do it and I'll tell him how jealous you get when he goes off with one of the girls from the camp. Naruto said before dodging around a swipe of Beska's hands with ease. The young teen cackled as Beska's smile disappeared and was replaced by a snarl and a bright blush. One that he was a bit shocked by being as nothing really phased her normally. Naruto, that isn't funny. She groaned. The blonde stopped and frowned. He knew what was on her mind. There was some woman in Asher's past. Back across the narrow sea in Westeros somewhere that still held his heart. Sure he slept around plenty here, but his heart still belonged to that far off and unattainable woman in his homeland. It annoyed Naruto to an extent when he thought about it but that was likely because he didn't know this woman in the slightest. He knew Beska though, and she was truly in love with Asher even if she was never going to have the nerve to tell him. Worrying about seeming too feminine for her line of work or something which was insane to Naruto. Beska was easily one of the toughest people he had met in his life and he had fought in gladiator pits for years and been a prisoner of a mercenary band. You really should talk to him, Beska. You might be surprised. You two could really, Naruto began before she ruffled his hair a little more roughly than before. Don't worry about it. You have more than enough things to think about other than some silly romance between him and I, right? She asked, getting him to roll his eyes. He wouldn't drop it so easily but for now he could hear the first of the raiding party returning and needed to make an appearance. I still think you should tell him. Let's get everyone settled though. Naruto said as he returned his focus to the growing crowd in camp. Leave that to me. She said seriously before following him back out to meet up with their troops. Keldore Encampment Essos 295 AC It had taken months to reach their destination. The Brindle Men tribes had been ready and waiting for them along the entire route of the river. They had descended upon the flotilla of Keldore in the fashion only savages could. The survivors could all still recall the sound of smacking lips and cracking bones as their fellows were literally devoured by the cannibals of Sothorios. Eventually they escaped the jungles of the southern continent and the Brindle men with it. The cost had been terrible though. Of Celebrion's followers less than a tenth had survived. A scant two hundred. It was horrible that they had made it. For another several weeks they had sailed through the seas. They passed by the Basilisk Isles which had been clearly marked on Genera Baileri's old maps. Sadly when they came to what should have been the old lands of the dragon the Keldore found only a terrible hellscape awaiting them. Long gone was the homeland of the dragon lords. All that remained was a twisted set of islands populated by monsters, never-ending flames, ruins, and the stone men. It was horrible and even more of Celebrion's people succumbed to the new threats found in the smoking sea. Whether by desertion or death, by the time the fleet had made it to good lands to attempt to settle they were less than a hundred in number. Even Celebrine herself had fallen terribly ill, hardly able to stand on her own and growing paler and thinner with every passing day. Theron the usurper may have intended for all of them to be killed on their journey, but while that hadn't come to pass he had succeeded in breaking their spirits. At least he had. In the short few weeks they had settled onto the coastline of the lands of the long summer, they had already found this new home to be perfect for them. The earth was healthy and arable, the local wildlife was bountiful for hunting, and the nearest other settlement seemed wary of them but not openly hostile. The locals had simply watched as Celebrine's people established their encampment. Tents and rudimentary huts as well as a small palisade around the camp's perimeter were quickly erected. All while the locals would simply send out riders to stare down at them and watch in suspicion. The watchers are back, Sylvanas said with distaste. 
So? If they meant us harm they would have attacked. Their town is decently sized, they could easily overrun us if even a portion of their numbers are fighters. Liadrin replied. Silvanas grimaced but continued to stare up at the single figure atop the ridge. He sat upon a horse and simply watched them. It was unsettling for her, but Liadrin seemed to somehow twist it into a good omen. Silvanas didn't believe in such things. After everything their people had suffered through she was certain these strangers were watching and waiting for a chance to strike. The perfect chance after they had studied the strangers who had come to their shores. Silvanas, you can't assume the worst just because of the trials of our past. Celebrine's weak voice said from where she was resting on a pallet. I have to assume the worst because you two always assume the best. I have to make sure we are ready so that we don't become easy prey for others in this world. Sylvanas replied resolutely. Celebrine sighed as she eyed her friend with guilt. The Keldore leader felt that Sylvanas had only become more aggressive and standoffish since leaving Quelthalas. An understandable reaction, truth be told she wasn't the only one, but Celebrine was worried that any future they hoped to have in this new land would be spoiled by the wounds of their people's past. Wounds she was responsible for not preparing them for the horrors they would face in their exile after the war. Perhaps they are simply as worried about our actions as we are theirs. We are the strangers to this land after all, they are probably worried about strangers from the south suddenly settling their lands. After all we've seen leading up to this, I cannot truly blame them or disagree with their wary reaction," Celebrion said. Maybe we should send an envoy. Just try and talk with them to figure a way to cohabitate in peace? Liadrin suggested. Good luck finding someone to volunteer for that suicide mission. As far as we know they could be just as bad as the Brindle men. Cannibals. Are worse. Sylvanas replied thinking of the fate of several of their female followers at the hands of the Brindle men. Being murdered and eaten would be preferable in her opinion. We'll send a guarded envoy. Celebrion stated getting both of her seconds to turn to look at her once again. Very well, but who? Sylvanas asked, not happy about her lady's decision but still willing to follow it. You of course. Celebrion replied with a tired smile. Me? You must be joking. Sylvanas said in surprise. Wondering if Celebrion had become feverish or if she simply wanted any hope of talks to break down. Yes, my lady, perhaps I should go instead? Liadrin asked. Sylvanas shot the other woman a glance but had to agree. Liadrin was tough and could take care of herself but she was far more prone to negotiate than Sylvanas herself was. She was happy to let Liadrin take her place. Not that she was thrilled about the idea at all, it still seemed like a death trap to her. You're both going. Celebrine said simply. Both? Shouldn't someone stay here with you? Liadrin asked worriedly. Liadrin, I am surrounded by our people. You two will act as my envoys to the natives and we will try to reach a compromise so that we don't become hostile with one another. It won't do for us to have to literally carve out a new home will it? Celebrine asked with a chuckle, as if certain they would win against a force easily capable of raising at least a thousand people to attack them. The two younger women shared a look at their lady's orders but didn't speak of disagreement. It was clear Celebrine's mind was made up and they would be going to meet with these strangers. Within the hour. I want you both underway within the hour. Celebrine commanded. Understood. Sylvanas said before leaving to visit her family. Liadrin was quiet for a time before she sighed. I truly hope this works out, my lady. As Liadrin left, the sickly Celebrine sighed as well. So do I, my friend. Just as they had been instructed Sylvanas and Liadrin were mounting up to meet with the locals. They had both learned the dragon tongue alongside Celebrion so if that language was still spoken, the hope was they could avoid confrontation. If not, well hopefully their soon-to-be hosts were capable at charades. This is foolish. We should wait for them to send an envoy to us, we're the ones at disadvantage. Sylvanas said as she and Liadrin began trotting along toward the human settlement. Sil, you really must calm down. It could cause issues if you don't. Besides, we may be disadvantaged but we are also the new arrivals. We're guests in their land. Liadrin replied. Invaders are more like. If this was Quelthalas and humans were suddenly settling in our lands we would have raised their encampment and butchered their people in their sleep. Sylvanas said. We aren't in Quelthalas and we don't have to be so vicious anymore. Liadrin said. Don't be so naive Lea. We have to be even more vicious now. That's the only way people survive in this world. By being willing to go that much further than their opponent. Sylvanas said, 
causing Liadrin to fall silent with a sad sigh. The pair rode on in silence after that. They could see the small handful of riders from the human town nearby, shadowing them as they rode along the hills toward the town. They continued to watch but not act aggressively so Liadrin took that as a good sign. Sylvanas was less comforted by that and more worried about the fact that prior to this point she had only ever seen a single rider at a time. Now there were more than half a dozen shadowing them. Sil, no, Liadrin hissed as she noticed the other woman's hands slipping toward the hilts of her blades. What do you mean no? They could be upon us in an instant. Sylvanas hissed with more venom than was necessary. But they haven't attacked. We have to try peaceful means first. It's what Celebrion wants. She ordered us to act as her envoy, now remove your hand. Liadrin commanded, surprising Sylvanas with the steel in her voice. Slowly her hand slipped away from her weapons. Liadrin seemed so sure of what she was doing, but still Sylvanas would be ready. If these humans tried something she wouldn't hesitate carving a path for herself and her friend to escape. We'll do it your way but when they attack us I'm holding it over your head for life. Sylvanas grumbled half-heartedly, getting Liadrin to laugh quietly. They returned to their silence and rode on. It didn't take much longer before they came to the walls of the town. In comparison to the palisade surrounding the Keldore encampment the walls of this town were far greater for defense. An old fortress acted as part of the defenses with looming stone walls while a mix of earth, stone, and wood formed tall sturdy walls for the rest of the town. The gatehouses were made of much fresher stone than of the old fortress and clearly had been constructed relatively recently compared to most of the defenses this place had. Well, so much for fighting our way out if things go poorly. Sylvanas quietly murmured as they came to a stop outside the walls. All the more reason to make sure that they don't go poorly then, hum, Liadrin said with a tight smile. The small collection of guards ahead of them shouted something out to them. It sounded similar to the language of the old dragon lords but different enough for neither Liadrin or Sylvanas to really understand what was being said. Now what? Sylvanas asked. We do our best, of course, Liadrin said before clearing her throat. We come in peace and hope to simply speak with your, your um ruler, Liadrin said struggling with the old Valyrian words. The guards exchanged glances before a rapid exchange of words occurred. An older guard, a short stocky man with scars and a steely gray beard began to bark what appeared to be commands at the others. Soon a young man that had been watching from the walls disappeared and the rest of the force seemed to snap back to doing menial takes. Sylvanas and Liadrin looked at one another before turning back to stare at the old man once again. He shot them a gap-toothed grin filled with surprisingly white teeth, though clearly was awkward with the long silence between them. He seemed to be growing impatient when finally a series of bellowed shouts came from the other side of the gates and one of them began to slowly creak open. The old man snapped something then and those gathered seemed to stop what they were doing to form up more properly around whoever it was that was coming to meet with Sylvanas and Liadrin. Both women dismounted, Sylvanas only after an insistent look from her friend, and took up places just in front of their horses. They imagined some minor lord or some other warrior caste individual to come meet them, or perhaps a courtier of some kind meeting them on behalf of their ruler. They hadn't expected a scarred up old man that made the old guard look young to approach them. Furthering his odd appearance was the fact that he wore a ragged black robe with a rope belt and no shoes. He was unarmed and dressed like a wretch but he carried himself with inhuman grace and strength and the humans all clearly respected him. He seemed to stop and size the women up. Clearly he'd never seen any of their kind before. It wasn't surprising. If there ever had been any of their kind in these northern lands they had been driven to extinction millennia ago. Before even the dragon lords had tamed their mounts. I bid you welcome strangers. My friends here have told me that you speak the language of old Valyria. Something I find rare but a blessing so that we might speak to one another. The man said much more fluently than either Sylvanas or Liadrian could accomplish with the old Valyrian. Greetings. Liadrian replied in her stilted accent. We come in peace and wish to discuss things with your leader. The man hummed and nodded at that. I am he, I suppose. As far as being a stand-in I think. You may call me Lissario, representative of our lord until his return. The old man said. You may call me Liadrin and this is Sylvanas. We come to represent our lady Celebrion. She remains at the encampment. I believe your riders have returned to monitor the encampment already. Liadrin replied as fluidly as she could manage. 
Lissario looked a bit confused but then quickly motioned for the gates to be fully opened. Come. Come I am certain we have much to speak on. I must also see if I can acquire a vision of my lord and give you a day he might return to us. Lissario said as he began making his way back into the town. The two Keldore women exchanged a look at the oddness of Lissario's words before they followed after him into the town. We will find a place for you to stay at the Holfast. Lissario said, pointing up at the remains of the stone fortress. We thank you. Liadrin replied as she and Sylvanas took in the sight of the town. It was a surprisingly well-maintained place. The people seemed hardy and healthy as well as strong. However there was an oddity that neither woman could quite place. Something strange that stuck out about this town. Lissario, tell me, what is the name of this town? Liadrin said. Ah, this is the town of Nern. Lissario replied with pride in his voice. Sylvanas ignored them as she kept her focus on the townsfolk that pointed and whispered. Gradually she noticed something. The people of the village were almost all either adults or elderly, smaller children were mixed in as well but older children and the younger adults seemed to be missing. As if there was a gap in ages among their population. Lissario, Sylvanas spoke for the first time, surprising the old man that she spoke old Valyrian as well, though not quite as well as Liadrin did. Yes, Sylvanas, correct. Lissario replied. Yes, answer a question for me. Sylvanas said with a hint of danger in her voice. One that had Liadrin worried and on edge. Things were going so smoothly she hoped that Sylvanas wouldn't do something to ruin that. If I can answer you I will be happy to, the old man said with a weary smile. Where are all your children? She asked bluntly, causing Liadrin to blink in confusion before realizing what Sylvanas was speaking of. She too now grew suspicious. Lissario sighed sadly before nodding his head. Come, we have much to discuss, and I will tell you of our home's plight. The women exchanged looks once again before surrendering their mounts to a stable boy at the entrance to the old fort and following Lissario into the stone tower at its heart. They soon found themselves stepping into a room that was far more ornate and less utilitarian than the rest of the town had been. It felt like an odd cross between a chapel and a simple sitting room, albeit with a pallet neatly stowed nearby. Sylvanas imagined that Lissario rarely left this room and often slept here for some reason. Please make yourselves comfortable. We no doubt have much to discuss, not to mention a rather long tale to tell. Lissario said as he made himself comfortable as well. The women gingerly lowered themselves into the cushions provided and gave the old man their attention. Now, I suppose the question is where to begin. Lissario idly stated. Perhaps we should start with you answering my question. Sylvanas said evenly, ignoring the look Liadrin shot her way. As good a place as any. Lissario replied after a moment of quiet contemplation. A few years ago a band of mercenaries was hired to attack our home, Lissario began to tell them about the raid that had claimed the leaders of the town as well as the fact that their children were kidnapped and sold off. It would be only the first portion of a very long process of the people of Nern and the Keldore coming to terms with one another and avoiding battle, but they would indeed avoid battle. At least with one another, King's Landing Westeros. 295 A.C. Rager had long grown used to his dreams being more than simple dreams. Eventually he had grown used to the strange double meanings and messages, some subtle and other obvious, that had come to his sleeping mind. Over the last few months he had begun to grow used to the new style of dreams he was experiencing as well. No longer were they a series of prophetic visions filled with one metaphor or riddle after another. The image was clearer and it was like he was visiting a place he had never been before. These dreams gradually grew more intense and clear. As if he was there, living, experiencing it himself. He had yet to bring that up to his mother or his wives. Only Arthur knew in the King's Guard Knight had handled it awkwardly as he had nothing he could do with such information. Rager felt much the same, only the situation was worse as he was experiencing these dreams directly. Slowly though things came to make more sense. They were events in another's life. At first Rager began to believe it was a previous life of his own. One he was being shown of a boy growing up and coming to manhood. He wasn't sure of the reason, perhaps the gods desired him to learn some sort of lesson or his previous self had found a way to send him a message. His theory was quickly proven wrong when he realized who this boy's mother was. The last Blackfire. Or he believed the last Blackfire. Clearly she had an heir. As the dreams continued on he found the guilt within himself built. 
If things had gone as he wished then this boy would have been raised closely with his own children and Rager could have fulfilled that dream that seemed so distant now. A peaceful and content world under the sway of the two dragon houses. It continued like that for a time. Watching his distant relations suffer and survive the tribulations heaped upon him and his fellow children that had been kidnapped and sold off. It was horrifying to see the kind of struggle these mere children went through just to survive. Never before had he found himself so thankful that his ancestors had been wise enough to bar such practices here in Westeros. He could not even bear to imagine the mindset of these masters at the way they treated human life. Rhaegar's own hands were not clean of blood, but he could happily note he was nothing like these demons across the narrow sea. He could only continue to watch as the boy was purchased by an elderly master. A strange sort, made all the more strange by his kind and caring demeanor toward the boy. Rhaegar watched on as the old master began to educate the boy in all manner of things. Most notably in magic. The talent the child had at the arts clearly surprised the old man though pleasantly so he supposed. Still the things they could so easily do with these spells both inspired awe and dread within the king of Westeros. It was so unnatural. Yet Rhaegar could feel the emotions and powers in the very being of the boy he was dreaming through. Where Rhaegar felt intrigued but also off put by the abilities the little scion of House Blackfire, that same little scion was in his element so to speak. Euphoria washed over him every time he mastered a new facet of his abilities. The difference in how the magic was seen by both of them seemed less of an instinct, and more to Rhaegar like the fact that being raised in the Church of the Seven, Rhaegar himself had developed a bias against warlocks and other wielders of mystical abilities. He would need to reel that ingrown bias in if he wished to fix the damage done and align the Targaryen and Blackfire families once more. That thought made him weary. The stubborn and unpredictable nature of this boy made that seem a Herculean task. That was not including the fact that when it came down to it he was partially responsible for the pain the boy suffered. This all also came from the man who was literally in the child's head on an almost nightly basis reliving his day. When things changed, they changed rapidly. It was as if one night the boy was living a surprisingly good life for a slave in Manteries of all places, and the next he was building an army had begun using actual necromancy. His former master, the vile treacherous snake that he was, had become a sort of puppet for the boy. He wasn't sure even one such as this man deserved such a fate, though he couldn't say for certain if the old man was even still in the corpse's head or if it really was nothing more than a puppet now. The speed at which the boy, no he deserved proper respect, he was no mere boy. The speed at which Naruto seemed to build a small army was astounding. They were solid as well. They practically worshipped him and those that had wavering loyalty abandoned him already once they freed themselves from Manteries. A feat which would likely wind up in the tomes of historians and masters even here in Westeros. That was where Rhaegar found himself now. Naruto and his band of survivors turned battle-hardened warriors had made camp beside a river. They were well off on supplies for the time being and beginning to close in on Naruto's true objective. The mercenaries that had raided his home and led him to this life in the first place. Rhaegar grew mildly nervous at that. Should the young Blackfire follow the line of questioning up through the various people responsible for the attack and assassination of his parents then he would surely come to realize at the end of that long chain was the house of Targaryen, his own family's ancestral enemy. One all too easy to pick up arms against once more, just as his forefathers had. He wished he could help him. Meet with him as not himself and forge a bond with him so he could tell him the full story and spare their families in the world a war in the future. As he thought such things the most unlikely of people approached him, within the dream itself. I can open a path between your minds if you like. Brakies said in his old voice causing Rhaegar to startle before he grew suspicious. Yet before he could even begin to question the former magi, the old man answered for himself. Fear no betrayal from myself. I am merely an imprint of my former self within my lord's mind. I have no true will of my own beyond that to help and strengthen my new master. Brakies explained. Here in this place between your minds and spirits you have somehow anchored yourself to my young lord. Unintentionally, I am certain as you lack even the most rudimentary of training in your latent magical abilities. Either way I have watched you as you have watched the memories of my master. It is clear to me you mean him no harm, at least at this time so I am happy to make the introductions between you that you so wish for. Brakies said without a change in expression or tone. Simply speaking a placid dead tone. Rhaegar eyed the dead man with trepidation. He wasn't sure what he should do in this event. 
He had an opportunity to do as he had wished but he couldn't help but feel suspicious of this magic and of the implanted being that was Brakey's, or whatever was left of him. He was known to be somewhat reckless, one need only look at his two wives, one that had essentially caused a war to break out, to know that. It was with that same reckless drive to do what he believed to be right thanks to his visions that lead to his accepting of Brackey's offer. It was bound to be an awkward meeting, especially as it was all taking place within the heads of arguable strangers on the other side of the world from one another. Naruto would typically be the first person to admit his life was far from what someone else might consider normal, or boring for that manner. He doubted that it ever would qualify for that criteria either. Even if he lived to be a hundred years old or more he expected strangeness would still hover about his existence till the end of his days. That being said even he had to acknowledge the fact that lately the strangeness seemed to have become a lot stranger and more frequent than he previously recalled. Sadly there wasn't really another descriptor for a strange man showing up with the mental imprint of his former and late master Brakey's. As if the company wasn't odd enough. The fact that this meeting was evidently taking place within his own mind whilst he was sleeping surely chalked the encounter in the top 10 or better strange things from his life so far. The more worrisome side of that was very clear as well. He was no longer alone inside his head and the imprint that Brakey's had left, unwillingly as it was, seemed to display far more autonomous ability than Naruto had previously been aware of. Far more than he was comfortable with as well. As for the stranger. Well who would feel pleased to have someone they didn't know poking around in their head, evidently witnessing their memories. I'm sorry, forgive me for being rude here, Naruto began to say, his sarcastic tone clearly not caring if he came off as rude. Who are you precisely, and why are you here? The figment of a former warlock once known as Brakey's began to step forward only to wilt faintly under the pointed glare directed his way by Naruto. I am no one all that important to you. At least for now. In fact it was never my intention to view your memories or thoughts. I didn't even know you existed beforehand. The stranger said awkwardly. Naruto eyed him with even more suspicion. That doesn't ease my worries. I suppose it wouldn't, would it? Maybe there is something I can say or do to prove myself to you, the man began to ask. Perhaps telling me who you are. Naruto suggested with a raised eyebrow and annoyed voice. I was just about to say something other than that. The stranger said with a good natured chuckle. The young man took in this stranger's appearance, though he supposed that it wasn't unimaginable that he could be disguising his appearance in some way. After all, they were in Naruto's mind. He was middle aged, though clearly healthy and in good shape for his age. He looked to be of Valyrian blood, but that didn't necessarily narrow it down as the freehold had plenty of those that possessed the markings of Valyria. He wished that he could get a bead on his accent, but truth be told, they weren't actually speaking. Neither was he actually seeing them, he just had an image in his mind of what the man appeared like, for some reason. Why is that? I don't understand why you can't at least give me your name, Naruto said, still plenty suspicious of the stranger. It would be distracting for you I think. Also it makes it easier in the long run if I tell you who I am at a later time, the man said with conviction. You are still not helping your case, Naruto huffed. Too true. The stranger hummed thoughtfully before they both realized that soon Naruto would have to wake for the day. I will return tomorrow night. Maybe I will have a way to convince you that I mean you no harm then? The stranger said hopefully but Naruto simply continued to eye him warily until he disappeared leaving only Naruto himself in the shadow of his one-time master behind. With the stranger gone, Naruto pivoted his attention to Brakey's. The imprint simply stared back at him in silence as Naruto narrowed his eyes into a fierce glare. You seem to have been fooling me all this time, huh? I should have known you were a sneaky bastard after what you tried to pull in the past. That's what landed you here in the first place, after all. Naruto said with obvious anger in his voice. I am bound to help your mind and ambitions in any way that I can. That is quite literally all that I exist for. At least all that I exist for now. I do not even recall the desires that led me here. Well, not the emotions and desires themselves. I do recall the events and the decisions I made that led to it. Brakey's explained clinically. Do not attempt to distract me. Naruto barked at his mental servant. I am not trying to master. Though if you were distracted I suggest some form of mental exercises to strengthen your mental acuity. I fear that if I am distracting you with such simple words then you are at danger when it will come time to play the game of diplomats and rulers. Brakey's replied. He seemed quite earnest as well which only served to agitate Naruto's darkening mood. Enough. 
You brought a stranger into my mind. Someone who could have done irreparable damage if they had desired to. Naruto snarled now, his anger was actually affecting the mindscape as it darkened and heated up to insane temperatures. None of which bothered Naruto. Brakey's was not so lucky. Master. I would not have allowed him to affect your mind whilst here. I literally cannot allow something like that to happen. Furthermore is that not proof of what the stranger was attempting to say? He meant no harm, and now you have proof to begin trusting him. Brakey's pointed out desperately. Naruto grew silent but the mindscape cooled and brightened slightly. The young lord huffed in mild irritation before turning away from Brakey's and slowly beginning to fade from his one mind as he began to wake up in the physical world. It is not enough, Brakey's, but I will allow him to prove himself to me I suppose. Naruto said before fully fading. That is all that I ask, master. It is my intention for this interaction to help you after all. Brakey's said with a bowed head. Naruto awoke to the warmth of his makeshift bed within his tent and grunted in annoyance as he stretched. He didn't feel very well rested but they had a long ways to go today. Nurn Esso's 295 AC Sylvanas had come to the very easy conclusion some time ago that Lissario and his people were not in fact a threat to her own. They could fight, she had no doubt about that, and clearly they were wary of outsiders, but if Lissario's quick acceptance of her and Liadrin was any sort of example of how the people of Nurn would act then, well they literally had nothing to fear. Lissario had lost himself in asking all manner of questions of Sothorios and their people. The man was clearly a scholar that had somehow found himself acting as regent for a few thousand people. It was refreshing to meet someone that wasn't either a warlord or barbarian. He also commanded the respect and obedience of his people, despite being a mere frail old man. That spoke to his skill as a leader. Liadrin had managed to weasel out from the man that he had been improving the town for years now. Advancements that he planned and made reality with only the labor of the citizens of Nurn as aid. All in the name of his lord and his inevitable return. That had been something of great interest. After all the young lord of Nurn was apparently one of the many children stolen away from the townsfolk by slavers the same time that their rulers had been murdered. The thought of Lissario and the people awaiting the return of this, boy for so many years after he was taken into slavery had been appalling. They clung to a hope for their vaunted chosen ruler but in Silvana's mind there was no hope. These people, or rather Lissario had told her horrible stories of what the slavers of Mantares were capable of. She couldn't help but wonder what inspired such faith in the son of their last ruler returning ever let alone as any kind of figure competent enough to lead them. Lissario had told her he had consulted the flames of course. Of course. As if that just answered all her questions and settled all her doubts toward the mental state of Lissario and his people. If anything it worsened it. It also filled Liadrin with a thousand more questions. Soon the two Keldore found themselves being educated in the faith of Relor the god of fire, as well as the people of Nurn's supposedly heretical faith in Relor's mirrored form, Melkor the god of shadow. Understandably it had all been quite a lot to take in. Though she had to say she was rather pleased that the people of Nurn didn't practice human sacrifice to fire on the level their former brothers and sisters did. That wasn't to say they didn't sacrifice criminals but they weren't about to start torching people due to their disbelief in Relor and Melkor. It wasn't all that much of a relief, truth be told, but it at least made it unlikely that Liadrin and herself would find themselves bound on a pyre and set alight. Sylvanas, Liadrin, you two mentioned riders trailing after you and watching your encampment? Lissario questioned, pulling Sylvanas from her own rabbit hole of thoughts. Yes, your scouts and sentries we assumed, Liadrin replied. Lissario grimaced at that and slowly began to shake his head. That filled Sylvanas with a mild panic that burned in her stomach. If they were not men of Nurn, then who exactly was watching and stalking their people? I fear those are likely a band of slavers. You must hurriedly complete your defenses. Should they fall upon your people, it is unlikely you will see them again as very few have the chosen protection of our god in this living world and even less among those that do not believe. Lissario said with worry. Sylvanas ignored the religious talk and focused on the fact that slavers were evidently prowling around her people. Her family and friends. What was left of them? The thought of them being kidnapped and taken to a place like Mantares, which Lissario had described in detail. Like Nern her people would never be able to mount a successful rescue of them. Not against these cities that boasted armies of soldiers and guards several times larger than all of the Keldore let alone the numbers of their warriors. Do you know where the slavers are camped? Liadrin asked. I'm afraid not. 
it's possible they are not even truly camped anywhere. This coastline had a great many places to temporarily beach a ship, long enough to raid several towns and villages before taking to sea once again. There are often even raiders from as far off as the Iron Islands of the Ironborn. You must hurry home and prepare your people. Lissario was quickly on his feet and leading Sylvanas and Liadrin back out into the town. Horis. Lissario bellowed in a voice that caught both women by surprise. The soft spoken old man seemed to change before their very eyes, and now Sylvanas truly saw it. The leader that kept these people devoted to their supposed prince wherever he was and had built Nurn into a strong, sizable settlement. The older guard from the gate came running to the old man's side immediately. Many of the townsfolk stared as well as Lissario and the now named Horis quickly had a discussion. Horus evidently disagreed with Lissario but was not going to go against his orders and soon ran off to rally a band of fighters and what looked like laborers. My friends, I do truly hope our peoples can get along. I won't sit by and allow others we are trying to befriend to suffer the same tragedy that our own home has in the past. I am not sure how long your encampment has before it is raided but I am sending soldiers and laborers as well as some supplies to try and strengthen your defenses. You must hurry with word to your lady though. Prepare for the raiders and know that you have friends coming. Those blessed by Relor and Melkor themselves. Lissario almost spoke as if he was giving a sermon. It finally clicked for Sylvanas that Lissario was less of a ruler and more a clergyman that had the trust of his flock. More so than any other she had seen in the past. It didn't matter at the moment though. She and Liadrin truly did need to hurry back to the encampment if they wished to warn their people and prepare for the inevitable raid. Come on Liadrin. Sylvanas barked as she led the way back to where the stable hands had been caring for their horses. Both women quickly readied their horses for the journey and mounted up before trotting off to the gate. Sylvanas found herself growing jealous of the large stone gatehouse now as well as the old fort that acted as a keep for the town. She wished that her people had such defenses already but perhaps once they drove off these attackers they could focus on constructing something like that so the thought of slavers could be almost a non-issue. I wish you luck my friends, Lissario called from beside the gates as they began to ride through them. Thank you Lissario. Until we meet again, Liadrin hollered back. We're counting on your help, still old man, Sylvanas added. Sylvanas, Liadrin hissed. As soon as they are ready they will be on their way. I vow it. Lissario replied, and soon the pair of riders were too far away to continue their shouted conversation. Liadrin and Sylvanas rode hard. The encampment was close enough and large enough that, should a raid come, then surely they would see the plumes of smoke from such an attack. Nothing sat upon the horizon like that, though, so it filled them both with hope that they had time. That didn't mean they slowed, of course. Soon their horses were struggling to maintain the pace and even the two warrior women found themselves growing tired from the rough ride back toward home. They were only halfway back when they were forced to stop and rest. It angered Sylvanas but she was no fool. If their horses gave out on them they would take even longer to reach their people. Sylvanas, it will be all right. We have a warning and as scant as they are, the encampment does have some defenses set up. Even should they attack before Lissario's people can arrive then we can hold them off for a time perhaps indefinitely. We're no slouches when it comes to fighting off barbarians and raiders after all," Liadrin said before sucking down a large swallow of water. Be that as it may, our people don't even know the raiders are planning an attack, Sylvanas said. No, they think Nurn is though. We thought the riders were scouts from Nurn this whole time and have been on high alert since we noticed them. Celebrion isn't going to be unprepared should the attack come before we return home. We are just going to make her better prepared for it. Liadrin again comforted. Sylvanas said nothing, instead turning her attention back to her mount and checking it over. Mentally she willed it to recover more quickly so that she and Liadrin might take to the road home sooner, but it was only wishful thinking. You need to distract yourself. Staring at the horse until it is capable of riding again is like staring at a pot of water waiting for it to boil, Liadrin said. Sylvanas huffed but turned back to the small stream they had stopped along to let the horses drink. The water was shallow and fast running but also extremely clear and fresh. It looked almost like a mirror, reflecting the sky and clouds as well as the treetops of the sharp embankment that made up the far side of the riverbank. It was only because of that that Sylvanas saw the men readying their ambush. She paused, but only briefly before pretending she hadn't seen them. She turned away from the water and casually walked back to her horse and began subtly preparing to fight while acting as if she was simply checking over her horse once more. Liadrin. 
Act casually, Sylvanas said, causing the other woman to tense only for a split second before she continued doing as she had been. Not long enough for their ambushers to really notice. What is it? The other woman asked. We are about to be attacked by those riders that followed us to the town to meet with Lissario. Act casually but be ready. There are at least six of them just on the other side of the stream hidden among the bushes and trees. Sylvanas explained, while keeping the tone she'd had earlier while just talking with Liadrin. So we just wait for them to attack? Liadrin asked with a bit of heat in her tone but otherwise seemed oblivious of the raiders in hiding. They don't have any bows or anything and they aren't expecting us to be ready. The moment the first ones jump down we strike. Kill them in at the edge of the stream, it's deep and fast enough to slow them down, but not enough to knock them off balance or anything. Sylvanas theorized. I hope you're right. Liadrin said. I usually am, though when we kill the first three or four the last of them will probably make a run for it, so we will need to head for the encampment immediately. I don't think we'll be getting Lissario's men before the raiders attack after all, Sylvanas said. Liadrin didn't reply simply masking a shaky breath to calm herself as an annoyed huff. Sylvanas tensed as she heard the bushes rustle and the raiders began to make their move. As the first man leapt from his hiding place and landed loudly in the water of the stream, Sylvanas was already moving in his direction while also drawing a sword with full intentions of removing the bastard's head. The second and third man both landed shortly after the first, weapons all drawn and started following the first toward where Sylvanas was racing to meet them with Liadrin following right behind her. The two Keldore stopped just in the shallowest portion of the stream while the remaining raiders loudly splashed down from their hiding places into the water and followed after their faster comrades. Truth be told, Sylvanas couldn't decide if she was disappointed or relieved by how clearly underprepared her opponents were for a real fight. As the first man came within reach of her weapon, Sylvanas wasted no time in launching a vicious swing toward him that he managed to block with his own roughly forged blade. He was far slower to recover from the clash though and with a twist of her arm and little more than a grunt she broke into his guard and slashed him deeply across the chest. The man screamed and stumbled back, tripping under the stones beneath the water's surface and sending himself tumbling onto his backside in the water. The second and third quickly passed by him with no mind though and attempted to overrun Sylvanas. Liadrin was already at her side ready to jump into the fight herself though and both men found that the women they had thought to capture and haul back to their camp as early trophies in the coming raid were not to be trifled with. Unfortunately for them this realization would come too late and they would have no choice but to remain and fight on. Liadrin caught her opponent's blade with her shield before disarming him, quite literally, with her own sword. She didn't allow him more than a chance to gasp at the sudden act before she also removed his head. Sylvanas handled her enemy much the same way, easily sidestepping his telegraphed attack and lopping off the offending arm with brutally cold efficiency, she kicked the screaming man onto his back with a clear contemptuous glare on her face. He collapsed under the shadow waters, gurgling as he began to drown while her boot kept him submerged and pinned to the floor of the stream. He didn't suffer long though as she brought her blade down to finish him before she stood fully to face his remaining companions. The remainder of the raiders had paused at the sight of their companions being dealt with so quickly and easily. One of them helped the injured man that had fallen back into the stream to his feet and both groups stared at one another as they paused to plan their next move. Sylvanas all but growled at the stupidity of her enemy. She wanted them to rush her so she could get this over with already. These men weren't true warriors. They preyed upon defenseless or at least nearly defenseless villages and had hardly fought a true battle in their life. Sylvanas had lived in a war that encompassed the entirety of her people. There was no real comparison and she just wanted this over and done with. Liadrin felt much the same way though she had less of a draw from the bloodlust coursing in Sylvanas' veins. What the hell are you waiting for? Come on! Sylvanas hissed while beckoning the raiders toward her. The men glanced between one another until the wounded one began shoving the others forward, howling at them no doubt demanding they make Sylvanas and Liadrin pay for daring to defend themselves. As the men advanced, Liadrin kicked the base of her shield splashing water mixed with mud and small stones up into the faces of the three advancing men. They lasted only a brief moment longer after that. Liadrin and Sylvanas had fought side by side for so long they needed no real communication and simply engaged the three enemies and butchered them in a quick fashion. The last man and apparent leader paled greatly at seeing the last of his fellows cut down, before trying to turn and run. The mix of his blood loss, panic, 
and the stream caused him to stumble though and Sylvanas was upon him in a moment, keeping a boot pressed down harshly on his back. Liadrin frowned as her friend brutally drowned the man, but she said nothing. She wasn't about to stop her from placing some rightful punishment on a man who no doubt had raped, murdered, and kidnapped for many years. Still, she wasn't fond of Sylvanas acting so cruelly. Sil, we need to head out soon. We still need to tell Celebrion. Liadrin said as she saw the man stop struggling and air bubbles stop leaving his mouth. Right, right. Let's go. Sylvanas said as she stepped off of the man and met back up with Liadrin to get the horses ready to ride once again. As they began to turn away from the bloody spot, Sylvanas stopped herself just long enough to spit at the corpses of their attackers before they continued on back toward the encampment. Lands of long summer they were late. In the time between encountering the small band of raiders and reaching their home, it seemed the main force of slavers had already assaulted the encampment. Thankfully it did look like the Keldore defenders, both the normal warriors and those that had been forced to take up arms to protect themselves, managed to drive them back. The question was how long that would last. Sylvanas and Liadrin both grimaced at the sight of the burnt and broken palisade and the handful of warrior corpses lined up and draped in a rough tarp. Burials would have to wait sadly. There was more important work to do still. They broke through. Sylvanas hissed. Her anger was used to mask her worry for those she loved as best as she could. Liadrin frowned at that fact. It was clear that the raiders had managed to make it through their main defenses and there was little chance that some of their people hadn't been stolen away. They faced much of the same with the Brindle men back in Sothorios. Both focused on getting back to Celebrion and telling her the news they had regarding the town of Bern and its people, and rather peculiar leader. No doubt their friend and leader could use some good news. The guards cheerfully welcomed them back and moved out of their way as they rushed toward the ramshackle house that had become Celebrion's home for the time being. The moment both women entered though a familiar scent assaulted their noses and both of them struggled to fight down the tears in their eyes. Not tears caused by the stench that permeated the small building but rather caused by what that stench undoubtedly meant. When they parted the thin sheets of fabric that acted as a bedroom door they found their beloved leader resting in her bed. She was wide awake, and in clear pain from the combination of illness and deep slash across her stomach and left leg. She smelled thickly of infection and death. You're both fine. We thought the worst when the attack came. How did you escape the village? She asked them. We didn't. The village hasn't been the one watching us. They tried to warn us about raiders and slavers working up and down the coast. They're even wanting to send fighters and builders to help us. Liadrin informed Celebrion, shocking the woman. Or so they say. Sylvanas hummed. Celebrion eyed her friend sadly. She reached out weakly and Sylvanas approached to kneel by her bedside and hold her hand. She knew that whatever Celebrion had to say was not something that would lift her spirits. She had a sinking feeling that she likely knew what the other woman had to say as well. Sylvanas. I'm so sorry. Illyria and Varisa were very brave. I saw them fighting along the camp's defenses. They both slew several of the raiders and rescued many of the people before they could be taken. Celebrion said sadly. So they have been, Sylvanas stammered out, voice thick with emotion, all of it painful and raw. Her chest ached and watery eyes stung. Taken, not killed. Celebrion replied. An even worse fate then. Sylvanas practically hissed. The older woman continued to look at her friend apologetically but they had much to discuss. They needed to plan for the next time that the raiders would come. The first strike had been little more than a probing attack and it had already cracked through their defenses and allowed the slavers to make off with a handful of prizes. When will the humans that you say are to help us arrive? Celebrion asked Liadrin. Sylvanas answered for her. Not before the raiders come again, we have to prepare. The normally stiff woman used her sleeve to dry up her tears before standing abruptly. The other two stared after her as she began to leave the hovel. There is much to do and too many people standing about doing nothing, Sylvanas growled. Sil wait. What about your sisters? Maybe we can, Liadrin began. I can't worry about them right now. I can't help them right now. We don't even know where the raiders are basing out of. You heard that old man, they could just have their ships beached a short ways away, or maybe they are a large encampment just out past the hills. Either way there is nothing we can do about it at the moment. Sylvanas ranted before storming out of the building and loudly rallying up the encampment to get to work on defenses and preparing for the next time the raiders came. Liadrin and Celebrion shared a look with the older woman sighing in sadness. 
Go, Liadrin. You can do nothing for me here and Sylvanas will need your help to lead our people in my absence. Something that will likely become permanent soon between my sickness and this new wound. Liadrin bit back a sob and nodded at the command of her leader. She couldn't trust her voice to not break and send her into a weak moment of sobbing at the fate of her beloved friend and leader. Rather than linger, she did as commanded and spun on her heel to God and help Sylvanas get the encampment ready. Naruto's army lands of long summer Naruto had not been happy in the last few days. He neared his objective. Would soon have what he wanted, but truth be told he was distracted. That aggravated him. He only partially blamed the distraction for it though. Much of the problem was his own fault. He was simply too curious for his own good. Just as the man in his mind had said he returned the day after the first time he had visited, it was almost humorous the way he apologized for not having any substantial way to prove he meant no harm to Naruto. Beyond that he was very new to this odd method of communication and expected Naruto likely had all the cards in his hands. Naruto never forgot to remind the man that he did not in fact have every card as he still didn't know the stranger's true identity. That had been something that the man couldn't argue but also one that hadn't changed. Naruto never received any details about his identity and honestly it seemed like he never would either. Despite that, in time he had slowly come to interact with the man regularly. He cursed his own curiosity regularly because of it but really there was nothing else to be done about it. His life was now filled with oddities, and an additional voice in his head, well it seemed like it was on the lower end of things that was considered odd. The young warlord in the making chose to focus on the tasks at hand. The preparations for the upcoming raid on the company of the crow encampment. They had scouted the region between themselves and the encampment out thoroughly. A few farmsteads and an old manor or two was all that stood between them. The geography wasn't kind though. While population centers were not an issue, and the chances of an ambush were low, the landscape was rough here. The mercenaries had selected their place for an encampment well. Steep hills with narrow but surprisingly deep streams in the gullies and valleys between them. It would be hard to traverse for an individual, but for a force roughly 100 strong it was infinitely more troublesome, especially factoring in the baggage train of wagons and carts that the group relied on to carry their food, water, and other supplies. On top of that the mercenary band had purposefully commandeered the remains of a destroyed village and rebuilt its basic defenses. It rested on top of a hill with a commanding view of the surrounding area. On top of its already steep and sandy hillsides, the encampment itself had a small sturdy wall erected. One that would give a defending force quite the advantage. Any sort of assault would likely end up with most of Naruto's forces dead. Likely without any real success or taste of revenge against the people that he had dreamt of taking his vengeance against for years. That was unacceptable. Sadly, unlike with Manteris and even Nern, this village had no underground catacombs or secret tunnels to try and use. It was rather limited in the paths that it could even be approached. Even fewer in the ways it could be attacked. What was likely worse, was that the mercenaries would be ready for them. They had no way of knowing Naruto was bent on attacking them out of vengeance, but the path he and his group had been forced to cut along the way here had made it clear the route they were going, and plenty of word about his little warband's movements and actions had spread across the area. Naruto had used that to his advantage in the past, it made seizing the supplies he needed from villages and farms easier and typically bloodless. However in this case it was a definite negative. The company of the crow would be waiting for them, and Naruto and his people didn't have the numbers or supplies to make a legitimate siege on even the pitiful wooden walls of the encampment. He needed to figure out a way inside. That was why he had called his captains and lieutenants together today. A suggestion from that damned voice. One he hated to agree with but couldn't exactly argue with when it was so sensible. Now Naruto stood beside them. Asher and Beska had easily been his choices for his captains. His right and left hands. They didn't question his orders, but they weren't afraid to speak their minds to him either. On top of that they were still the most protective of him out of everyone else. The only people who perhaps could claim otherwise were his lieutenants. The group of gladiators he had rescued and healed back in Manteris had begun to dwindle over time and through conflict, but those that remained formed his makeshift officer corps. They all but worshipped the master healer, by this point and were chomping at the bit to take on a band of slavers, just as the vast majority of his fighters were. What slave didn't want a chance to take the life of the scum that ripped them from their home and sold them off into their own personal hells? The war room was really just a round table meeting around the dying embers of a fire pit in the late evening before they would come within sight of the company of crows encampment. 
they had all eaten and drank their fill and most of the force had dispersed to either sentry duties, cleaning duties, or much needed sleep. Marching was rather exhausting after all. You all know by the scout reports what we're dealing with. The latest count of the crows on that hill was less than 30 in total. Times have thankfully been hard on the rotten bastards but combined with their defenses and the rough ground, they could take on a force many times their number and these mercenaries aren't the normal run of the mill slavers, Naruto advised. They run slave catching jobs as a supplementary way of making pay. These guys are the real deal. They would make the soldiers back in Mantaris their sweethearts for a night just to say they had. We need to be smart here. Asher agreed. We always have to be smart. We'll always be the underdogs, so we'll do as we have always done and play it smart and keep faith in the master. One of the more devout lieutenants said surely. It takes more than faith to survive a battle. We need a strategy. A real strategy. Beska reprimanded the zealotous talk. We do. That's why we are here. I trust all of you more than anyone else out there. More than the voices in my own head even. Naruto murmured the last bit, but the others took it as a joke and chuckled. He chuckled somewhat awkwardly with them. So what do you want to do then, Naruto? One of the others asked. The youngest of them blew out a breath and leaned back against the log behind him to stare up at the stars in the sky. He could recall lessons regarding the constellations by both Brakies and even longer ago by his parents and Lissario. He missed staring up at the sky on warm nights with his loved ones and picking out the constellations. He doubted anything similar would ever really arise for him. Instead he had to deal with problems for adults. Something he had become far earlier than he should have. I have a few ideas, but nothing we do will be easy. Everything we do will require some sort of trickery. No matter what though it starts with gaining an insider. At this point the encampment will never allow new people to stay within their walls. Not a chance. They know we are coming and are bunkering down just for us. How kind. Beska groaned. But, they aren't all doing that. Every morning they send out five riders. Scouts that split up and head in different directions. They mostly just ride to various hilltops and look for us to be approaching. They probably spotted our own scouts yesterday. Thankfully our scouts have been surrounding the encampment, so despite knowing that we are coming from Mantaris, they can't be certain of the actual direction we'll approach their camp from. Naruto explained. So, what we swing wide and come in from the opposite side? They'll still see us coming. Asher pointed out. So they will, but it's more than just that. Naruto said before he stood up in front of the others. We'll need to start by snatching up their scouts with our own. I have a few ideas of what to do with them when we do, he continued. Magical stuff, boss? One of the other lieutenants asked. You bet. Something to give us a real edge in a fight, Naruto replied. Once we've done that, we'll send the scouts back. Not alive of course, but we'll have a farmer transport them back. Say it's a show of us wanting to just pass the company of the crow by. As long as they take the former scouts back into the encampment, we have our inside men. The group nodded along. They didn't truly understand their leader's abilities, but they didn't need to to have faith in his plan working. Especially when he seemed completely confident in it. That isn't everything though. For those that we don't plan to send into the assault on the hill, I want them to move around the other side of the encampment. They'll be staying hidden behind the hills, but the ground is dry and sandy here. I want them to shuffle their feet and kick up as much dust as they can while moving. Then the night before I want each of them to set two fires. Meanwhile our main force will move into position in the night on our side of the encampment and we won't set any fires or light any flames. Naruto explained. They'll prepare to defend the wrong side of the hill. Beska nodded with a smile. Plus they'll be exhausted. Most of them will stay up all night taking turns to be on watch for a surprise attack while the majority of our troops can move into position in the first part of the night and take time to rest. Asher pointed out. Exactly, and when the sun rises, we'll begin our advance. The sun will be casting us in the shadow of the hills until it is a good distance into the sky. We'll have shadows covering our advance all the way to the base of the crow's hill. Naruto pointed out. The group felt their excitement at the upcoming assault. If everything went smoothly they could be right at the mercenary company's door before they even realized how many enemies they had to contend with. How do we get in though, boss? I know you planned on the scouts being useful thanks to your magic, but if we climb up that hill, we might be climbing right into a wall of spear points waiting for us if we aren't careful. Another lieutenant pointed out. Have faith in me. I'll make sure that the side our people are coming up is ready for them. 
I'll be leading the way after all. Naruto confidently proclaimed. The group murmured their agreement and Naruto dismissed everyone to head off to bed. He watched with a small smile as Beska and Asher remained together at the fireside talking a bit longer than the rest. He could feel a small sliver of jealousy in his heart at seeing them together. Not jealousy for one or the other, but rather for them having someone and he himself being alone. He snuffed such an emotion out with prejudice. Asher and Beska were closer to him than any other person in the world. They were family, and he refused to feel anything but happiness for them. He did feel rather lonely though at least until he felt the nudge in his mind of the stranger wishing to visit yet again. What is it you want now? He asked as he allowed the stranger within. Ah, sorry, I am just hoping to see you again. I suppose I did wish to ask how your briefing with your officers went. The stranger said. He always seemed to try so hard to make himself out to be a friend for Naruto. Your word choice makes it sound so stuffy. Like we are nobles from Westeros. Hum. Are you perhaps from Westeros, stranger? Naruto asked. The man's presence seemed to stiffen and Naruto narrowed his eyes. So yes, or at least originally. So you won't share your homeland with me either. That's not surprising by this point. Westerosi for sure though. At least to an extent. Not much magic out to the west. From what I've heard anyway. I wonder how you managed something like this then. Naruto pushed on. I see you aren't really in the mood to talk tonight are you? The stranger replied. Oh I am actually. You're the one that always struggles to answer any questions. Naruto replied. What do you plan to do once you've taken your revenge on the mercenaries? Naruto huffed slightly at the stranger, ignoring his question once again. I suppose you'll find out. Or maybe you won't. Maybe this will be the last time I allow you into my mind as a guest. Fine. I am Westerosi, in a way. That is the best I'm getting tonight I suppose. Well then good night stranger, Naruto said. No, wait, you didn't answer my question though, the stranger argued. It's an aggravating feeling, I know it well. Naruto mockingly replied before forcing the man from his head and taking a moment to torture the soul of Brakies for a moment to blow off some steam. The damned old necromancer was responsible for most of his annoyances these days so he could feel a little bit of the heat from all of that. It was only fair. Naruto laid down for the night. He wanted to get some good rest after all. The next morning would prove to be the start for a busy few days. The first few steps in Naruto's plan had panned out nicely. As expected, in the morning as the sun was just beginning to come up the company of the crow opened its narrow gate up and let loose a small band of riders that took off in search of good vantage points to see the neighboring valleys and spot the force Naruto was leading. Unfortunately for them, Naruto's scouts had been lying in wait for a few hours along the dirt paths that the riders used to traverse the hilltops. The fights were unfair and rather brief. They were killed and their corpses drugged back to camp where Naruto awaited them with his foul magic spooling up for yet another dark miracle. The spells came a bit easier to him now. The magic felt ever more natural and powerful as well as smooth in some way. Similar to Brakey's before he allowed his magic to flow into the corpses. However, where Brakey's had been alive, these men were empty husks. They made perfect puppets for what Naruto wished to do. Those that followed him were still wary of such powers, but had grown to accept them from Naruto by now. Their enemy would provide their own way into the encampment. Naruto was happy for that. So were the warriors that knew it would be far less deadly if they had someone on the inside to give them an opening. The five scouts were piled in a spare cart and lots were drawn among several of the lowest tiers of Naruto's fighters. A trio were selected and dressed up like farmhands before being set to carry the bodies back up to the encampment's gate. As he had hoped, the trio were forced to leave, but the men inside kept the corpses for burial. They had at least some decency. With that handles the small army split. A handful of capable fighters accompanied the non-combatants in circling around the crow's encampment all while shuffling their feet just as Naruto had commanded. They kicked up a huge cloud of dust that made it look as if many times their number were on the march there, while Naruto had his men in the actual combat force carefully move their feet to keep the amount of dust they kicked up to a minimum. Both groups maneuvered all day, both stopping as the sun set and beginning their second set of directions. The decoy company began setting up as many campfires as they could along the hillsides. Soon well over a hundred points of light covered the hills and the defenders watched them in anticipation for a nighttime raid. On the other side, 
Naruto and his warriors took some time to rest and collect themselves before they would advance to the far side of the final hills between them and the company of the crow. Most are some cold food, bread and cheese for the most part. Naruto himself refrained. He felt a bit nauseous. Not at the prospect of fighting. He was an old hand at combat despite his youth. However the worry about the losses his men could suffer trying to scale the hill and walls before them did fill him with dread. Even if everything in his plan worked out his best estimates foresaw drastic casualties. If the enemy figured things out too soon, they could pick Naruto and his people apart with bows and crossbows before they could even reach the walls. There remained a very real possibility of absolute failure. Something that more than likely would simply see himself and his friends dead along with everyone that had put their faith and freedom on his shoulders. Buck up. A voice whispered beside him as a figure took a spit to sit next to him. Asher, shouldn't you be spending a bit of time with Beska? A fight like this could go any sort of wrong. If I had, Naruto began only for his friend to cut him off. Beska and I both know what is in store. We've both fought enough to know any could be our last, we could get through this unscathed and slip up while on the march and wind up dead from a bad fall. Asher lectured. Maybe. But don't you think it would be nice to spend what may be your last moments with the woman you love? Woman I love? Listen kid, I care for Beska that we're not like that. No, your heart belongs to some Westerosi. Low blow, but no I moved on from her. I'm never going to Westeros again anyway. Things with Beska aren't what you think they are though. Does Beska know that? Naruto asked as he shoved Asher slightly. The older man remained silent for a moment before shooting Naruto a look. He seemed to have realized that Naruto easily deflect the conversation away from what he initially intended it to be. As I was saying. Buck up kid. You have given us a better chance than we could ever have hoped for otherwise. It's a good plan too. It will work. Asher reassured him. Naruto grinned faintly, thankful for the reassurance even if it did little to actually assuage his worries. We need to get moving soon. Pass the word along we'll be moving into position for the attack soon. Naruto said as he readied to advance his force in preparation for the dawn attack. Asher stared after the young warlord and sighed slightly. He always worried about the boy more than he probably needed to. If anything, Naruto was probably the one that needed the least amount of worry in their force. The Westerosi warrior turned his eyes to peer through the darkness toward where he knew Beska was rousing up and readying others in their force. The little chief's words rolled about in his head uncomfortably and he decided to press the issues that they brought up to the back of his mind for later. Hopefully there would be a later. Then again, if anyone asked Asher, taking this hill was nothing compared to the miracle that they had managed to pull off back in Mantaris. If Naruto's plans could get them through that sort of madness, then Asher would trust him to see them through this as well. As Naruto had expected. The mercenaries within the encampment were a bit sluggish as the light began to shift and the sun began its work of ushering in the dawn. They were focused on what they suspected was a large encampment of former slaves camped just past the nearest hills. The common hope among them was that the young warlord and his force would do as the apparent farmers had said the day before. The message had simply been to leave Naruto and his people in peace and let them pass by. It was needless to say that if that had been the true intentions of Naruto and his band the company of the crow would have been happy to let them continue on their way. Some of them prayed that was the case but all of them suspected that it wasn't. Though they had no way of knowing that the encampment across from them was nothing more than a decoy. As the sun slowly crept upward, the shadows from the eastern hills darkened in contrast to the sun and slowly Naruto and his forces crossed the remaining distance to the base of the hill. The plan had held so far. But as the warriors began following Naruto up the steep incline toward the base of the walls, things changed. The incline was steeper than expected and far sandier than they had been prepared for. The climb took twice as long as it should have to climb, and soon the sun had climbed high enough to begin reflecting off the shiny bits of metal they had on them. The moment a guard spotted them, halfway up the hill, he began screaming with all his might to alert everyone within the camp. Naruto cursed under his breath before standing up and forging ahead as quickly as possible. The loud jangling and thumping of the equipment and armor of the rest of his group told him that they were all right behind him as they tried to cross the last bit of open ground before they had some protection from the walls because of the angle. Sadly, the defenders had far less difficulty maneuvering and quickly began positioning themselves to rain arrows and bolts down on Naruto and his people. The deadly hail of arrows fell upon them. Initially in an uncoordinated handful of poorly aimed shots, 
but soon enough it was the well-trained and practiced accuracy and speed of career archers. They had become fish in a barrel on this hillside. Naruto cursed as one of the men beside him let out a brief but loud scream when an arrow lodged itself into his eye and sent him tumbling backward down the steep hillside. Keep pushing. Their walls are poorly made, if we can make it there they won't be able to hit us as easily with the arrows. Naruto bellowed out rallying his force. Casualties were beginning to mount though and even as he, Asher, and Beska made it to the shadow of the wall their force was spread out across the hillside and still at the mercy of the defenders. Something had to be done before they tried to break through the wall here, thankfully now was the perfect time for Naruto to use the weapons he had prepared before the battle had even begun. Asher and Beska knew to protect him while he appeared to be sleeping. Controlling multiple puppets was still difficult. His physical body would be vulnerable as long as he was using them. Five sets of faded bland eyes opened and took in the interior of the encampment. All five of them had been placed under some sheets of fabric and laid out along the wall. No doubt in preparation to bury them when there was time. There never would be time now though. Slowly and stiffly all five sat up and pushed the sheets aside. They awkwardly climbed to their feet and shambled along the interior of the camp. Nearly all of the defenders were arrayed along the short walls using bows while a smaller amount raced about with bundles of arrows to keep the wall supplied. A few still stood guard on the far wall as they were still worried another attack might come from the direction of the former slaves' camp. Good. Now how best to ruin their defense and open up the path? Naruto thought to himself until he spotted a rack of tools set alongside a tent. A few wood axes, hoes, and hammers. Perfect. The corpses stumbled forward toward the rack. A handful of mercenaries raced past them only to freeze at the sight of the walking dead. They began screaming, gaining the attention of the others in the camp. Most of those present stood stock still in horror as the five dead men collected the tools and turned toward the wall where Naruto and his force was launching their assault. Slowly they began moving toward the wall causing some of the defenders to snap out of their shock and begin peppering the undead with arrows. To their great dismay even when pierced by a half dozen arrows the five dead men continued on unimpeded. The blows only served to stumble them as they plodded along toward the wall. A handful of men decided that they had no choice but to charge them. With a battle cry several members of the company of the crow rushed toward them, but the dead might have been stiff and walked slowly, they still swung with all the strength the men they had once been possessed. Only now they had no need to worry about the limits their body once possessed in fear of damaging themselves. The first man to meet them in hand-to-hand -hand combat found a hammer crashing through his attempt to block it and crushing the side of his face. He tumbled down onto the ground and the corpses advanced over the top of him, stepping on him as they went. Fucking monsters. One of the men screamed as they tried to behead another of the undead warriors, only for his arm to be caught and yet another of the bodies to step up behind him and bury an axe into his back, crushing his spine and tearing a massive wound out of his abdomen. What do we do? One of the others asked the more experienced members of the mercenary company, but he got no answer. Again the defenders on the wall peppered the dead men with arrows to no avail. Naruto's puppets eventually reached their targets. The supports to the walkway that the majority of defenders stood upon. They wasted absolutely no time in attacking the thin wooden beams with all their might. One after another the beams snapped and cracked under the mixed assault of axes and hammers. With the weight of so many archers standing atop it the walkway began collapsing almost immediately. By now panic had spread among the mercenaries and they attempted to scramble down off of the defenses to try and get to safer ground in the center of the camp. That wouldn't remain safe for long. As Naruto dropped direct control of the corpses and instead simply set them upon the defenders he came back to consciousness within his own body. Around him his men had managed to make it to the wall with the confusion he had sown among the enemy. Now they had taken to using axes of their own to tear openings in the enemy walls. You're back, looks like your insurance plan worked out for us, boss. Beska grinned viciously, a bloody line where an arrow had narrowly missed embedding into her head ran along her cheek. I try not to disappoint. What are our casualties? Naruto asked. Hard to tell right now. Asher began to answer only to pause as their men let out a roaring cheer and forced their way into the camp as they broke through the wooden walls. Naruto and his crew followed after them. Inside several of the defenders were already killed by his undead drones. 
While the company of the crow had managed to finally fell them by beheading them, the damage was done. The tide was turned entirely in Naruto's favor and soon enough those few that weren't carved up by his men were forced onto their knees before him. Among them were the man he had dreamed of facing and a young woman that had clearly faced a lifetime of abuse as the leader's personal plaything. Naruto recognized her easily as well. The only other known survivor of those that had been taken away from Nern all those years ago. He glared down at the two of them as he contemplated just how to go about things now. The End Remember to subscribe and like this video. See you in the next video.